talk to us. It's great. Thanks for everybody's patience and flexibility. Yes, uh, thank you very much, everyone. We, we are here in the Elizabeth and Nicholas Schoenborn matter. We are here. Um, I did receive the CRA, pardon me, the CR2A stipulation and agreement uh, signed by the parties. Uh, that was delivered to me today. And I understand there's a few issues that are outstanding on the parenting plan and also issues related to firearms, personal property, and attorney fees. Ms. Holder, any other items that need to be addressed today? There might be some a few issues related to personal property if the parties are able to hash that out. Um, I believe that we had gotten a, a separate exhibit with some of the personal items, but it wasn't done in time to get it to you this morning. Um, and so we would like to get to those at some point as well. Okay, great. That sounds great. All right. Um, so with that, let me just double check with the parties. We're here for a binding settlement conference. And so the general idea with binding settlement conferences is, is that there's um, not necessarily that the rules of evidence don't apply. The parties are free to uh, call their witnesses or pre present information in, in a more informal matter uh, through questioning and presentation. And um, yeah, so any uh, any preliminary issues before we jump in? Okay, hearing none, let's jump. Uh, the petitioner is Ms. Schoenborn. Um, so we'll turn the time to, to Ms. Baldwin. Very good. Um, so the first person that we should hear from is the guardian ad litem. Um, she is uh, here and present. Great, thank you. All right, and Ms. Corey, thanks for your flexibility also this morning. Thanks for your patience. Um, I, Ms. Baldwin uh, is and Ms. Holder, is it your preference that Ms. Corey just go ahead and, and speak her piece? And then if you have any follow-up questions, and you can pose those. I think that's appropriate. Ms. Holder? Thanks, Your Honor. Okay, great. Ms. Corey, how do you feel about that? Uh, a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I was originally appointed to this case in July of 2020 um, with all of the parties. Um, and of note, I think, is the fact that the children were seven and 10 then. And this case has gone on a very long time. And um, my concern for the children is that um, I, I suppose, as usual, that the longer it drags on, the, the more damage is done. Um, in my report, um, which was filed in May of 2021, I recommended that a uh, plan be crafted, a parenting plan be crafted that would work toward a more liberal visitation for Mr. Schoenborn um, as he remained drug free. And um, Unfortunately, that did not happen. Um, I, I still believe that a graduated uh, approach to visitation is the correct one, especially when the kids have been um, estranged basically from their father for such a long time. Um, I believe also that the uh, children are going to require, at least the daughter is going to require a reunification counseling or something of that nature, which I believe is addressed in the uh, mom's parenting plan as well. Um, do the attorneys have any specific questions that they'd like for me to address? Sure. So I'll start. Um, would it be appropriate to require, um, especially Kenna, who's now 13, to sort of jump into phone calls with father sort of cold without any sort of reunification counseling before that? Um, that's an angle I hadn't thought of. Um, I, I think that that could be very difficult for her. Um, but I do understand that she has been um, in counseling. At least she was at the time that I was dismissed from the case. Um, and I would hope that that is an issue that she is working on. Um, whether, hmm. um, I would have to take a, a harder look at the, the current circumstances to really be able to answer that question, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, you issued your report, as you mentioned, back in 2021. Is that fair? Yes. And other than the fact that you're aware of Mr. Schoenborn's positive drug tests since then, have you had significant contact with the parties? No. 
Um, and so your information is largely from about two years ago or so. It is. And um, I have also read the more current pleadings. Um, and would you like to see, um, do you have concerns about Mr. Schoenborn's underlying mental health conditions and how they could impact his um, interactions with the children? Yes. Um, and similarly, do you have concerns about his underlying mental health issues and how those impact his likeliness to relapse um, into using substances? Yes. And would you like to see him address his mental health issues sufficiently? Yes. Do you think that's critical to him being able to eventually reunify with the children? Um, again, I am not aware enough of what the current mental health status might be to really make a judgment call on that. Would it be fair to require a mental health evaluation or psychological evaluation um, for Mr. Schoenborn so that everyone, including him, could be aware of the his sort of current needs um, and current issues? Um, yes, I think that would be fair. Um, you indicated that during the time where you were investigating the case, uh, mother had appropriately engaged children with counseling. Yes. Um, and mother also appropriately engaged in counseling. I, yes, I believe so. Um, and would that be appropriate after a significant traumatic event? Absolutely. Um, reasonable that anyone would need some counseling to help with sort of dealing with the, the emotions behind one of those traumatic events. Yes, absolutely. I think those are my questions for you. Uh, Ms. Holder may have some. Thanks. And you, Chelsea. Hmm. When you say that you would like to see Mr. Shornborn address his mental health issues with counseling, is there any specific way or any specific type of counseling you, in your opinion, thinks he needs to have? Um, I do think that he definitely needs to address what is behind his uh, substance abuse issues um, and whether the uh, emotional upheaval that ended in the domestic violence confrontation, whether that was um, something inherent or something that was exacerbated by the drug use. Do you think that, um, that addressing those issues, he should be in some type of group therapy? Do you think that would be helpful? Like NA? Um, yes, I do. And what about individualized therapy? Yes. Speaking with a counselor one on one. Yes. Um, and what about seek okay, and what about um seeking any type of medication that would um quell those urges or those cravings for um his addictive drug tendencies? Um, such as methadone or suboxone. Uh well, since he has already went down that road, I would like to see maybe an alternative um therapy tried. And is there any alternative therapy that um, comes to mind? Um, that would be whatever results a substance abuse evaluation would recommend. Okay, so you would recommend that he have a new substance abuse evaluation done? Yes. And um, I know that your communication with the parties was pretty limited back to at the mostly the beginning of this case again. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and you were able to um, interview Ms. Shornborn in this case, and I believe also her mother, Diana Smith? Yes. Okay, and do you remember those interviews? Uh, pretty much, yes. Okay. Um, did you have any thoughts regarding how Ms. Shornborn and her mother interacted with the children and um, the types of, were you aware of anything that they were specifically saying to the children about this case? Um, not anything specific. I realized that um, this is a very, very tight family unit that um, depends upon the grandmother uh, quite a lot to run the day-to-day -day operations of the family. And that mother and daughter were very close, as were the children and the grandmother. Do you have any opinion as to 
uh, Miss Smith's influence on the children and their opinions about Mr. Shornborn? Well, um, as I said, the grandmother is very integrated in with the family and they are very close. Um, I would have to say that they respect their, I believe they call her Gaga. Hmm. And when you say that you believe the children respect her, can you elaborate on that a little bit? I believe that the children um, put quite a bit of weight in what she has to say. And do you know what she has to say about Mr. Shornborn? Um, she did not, at the time, it was, it was fairly uh, recent from the event that had happened. I believe her opinion was um, definitely probably a little bit stronger at that point, but um, she, I believe my general impression was that she felt that Mr. Schoenborn was not a very involved father. Um, and do you remember what led you to that conclusion? Um, yes. If you hang on, a, can, may I consult my notes? Yeah, that's fine. Yes. Ms. Smith said to me, Nick was always busy with work and school. He was more of a hands-off traditional kind of dad. At the time, I would have said he's a pretty good dad and okay dad. Before this, I never saw him hit the kids. They do timeouts and things. Okay. And um, based off of that, do you remember any other? What was your general feeling about Ms. Smith's attitude towards Mr. Shornborn after the domestic violence incident in 2020? Well, she wasn't happy with him. <laughs> um, we, we talked, I believe, more about um, the positive aspects of her daughter as a parent rather than the negative aspects of her son-in-law. Okay. And what were some of those positive aspects about Ms. Shor Mrs. Shornborn? Um, that she was a great mom involved in uh, all aspects of the kids' lives, um, that she was uh, a primary parent and that she was uh, much akin to a single parent because of uh, Mr. Schoenborn's work schedule. Okay. And in your, um, in your assessment of Mrs. Schoenborn, would you say that she is protective? Yes, fiercely. And how... And when you say fiercely, can you elaborate on that for us? Um, Mrs. Schoenborn is what I would call a mama bear. Um, and um, by that, I mean that she would do anything for her children, that she would um, stand in front of a bus for them. Um, have you by any chance gotten to see any um, either size proposed parenting plan going into this conference? Yes, I saw uh, Mrs. Schoenborn's proposed plan. So you haven't had a chance to see Mr. Schoenborn's plan? I don't believe I have. Um, so if you'll bear with me, um, I'll just ask you some questions based on some of the things that we have requested in the parenting plan to get um, your feel for them. And if it sounds like something okay. that you potentially would recommend. Section four, which is the limitations on parents. Um, and so, and these are prohibiting Nicholas Shornborn's behavior. Um, so he shall not consume alcohol within eight hours of contact with his children. Do you remember whenever you met with Mr. Shornborn, if he ever admitted that he had an alcohol addiction issue? Um, I believe I, I can't say for sure. I, I think he did say that there was a time during his marriage that he drank quite a bit, but I am not 100% pos uh, positive I recall that correctly. Okay. Um, limits number two, he shall not consume any illegal or non-prescribed drug at any time. You would agree with that one? I would agree with that one. Okay. Should not consume marijuana or marijuana-derived products within eight hours of contact with his children. Yes. Okay. He shall not have any firearms at his home, residence, or vehicle when the children are present. Yes. Shall not use social media to contact the children. Um, shall not use third parties to do so and shall not direct social media posts or messages at the children. 
Um, I'd have to give that one some thought. The children were not of really social media age when I worked on my report. So understandable. Um, and then Mr. Schwamborn should not contact the children via phone, text, or otherwise use a third party to do so, except as indicated in his parenting plan or as directed by a unification counselor. Um, I, I guess I would want to know if these are things that are part of phasing in further um, visitation or if these are things that are forever. Yes, absolutely, which segues us into the phasing program, which would go to section eight of the parenting schedule. So phase one would say that once he has completed all evaluations that he would need to have done as recommended, um, the treatment per, per require, um, sorry, evaluations and treatment provided in section four, which we just talked about. And he also abides by what we just discussed. And he provides evidence that he is clean and sober for three months. He shall have one supervised 30 minute phone or zoom call with the children per week at a time to be agreed upon by the parties. So he would not, would you agree or disagree or recommend that he should not have contact for three months and he has to be sober and he has to be abiding by the things that we just mentioned. Um, actually, I would fall somewhere between that proposal and the proposal of one year. Um, I would, I would fall in somewhere around six months. We can usually fake it through three months, but six months is a little bit harder. Okay. And I'm, I'm not going to read every single bit of the provision. I'm kind of going to jump through it very quickly okay. um, because there, there is more in phase one. Um, but are phase you, two does involve. Ms. Holder, I was just going to double check. Are you, are you, when you're referring to the parenting plan, are you using your proposed parenting plan? I'm sorry. You? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. I'm using the one that we proposed. Thanks. And, um, and jumping down through phase one a little bit more, um, once he's provided evidence, he's clean and sober for four months we ask that he would have an unsupervised one hour phone call per week. So that's, do you agree that's closer to what you would recommend as opposed to the three months? It's closer, yes. Okay. And then once he's clean and sober for five months, he should have two unsupervised phone calls per week at one hour. An hour is a long time for a child, but um, okay. you're heading the right direction, I suppose. Okay. So perhaps maybe up to one hour, depending on how the child. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like that, yes. Okay. And then phase two talks about reunification counseling. Do you believe both children, both Kenna and Gage, should have reunification counseling? Yes. And what do you believe that reunification counseling should look like? Um, I believe that should be left up to the reunification professional. Okay. In that case, we're going to skip right through phase two with reunification counseling and the specifics. Um, but would you agree that with reunification counselor with one or both of the children, um, that it could run concurrently with the first phase of um, making sure that he abides by everything we talked about previously, staying sober and seeking counseling and treatment? Um, yes, I, I, I think those could run concurrently quite easily and that to separate them out might be um, making the process longer than necessary. Okay. So I, um, I'm not going to go through all the phases and all the specifics, but because I've got a good idea that you think six months is about the good area for contact to begin. At what point do you believe in-person visitation should begin, whether supervised, um, preferably supervised? Um, well, I think that would be different for both children. I think since um, Gage had a history of um, supervised visits with his dad already that um, there would be fewer obstacles. Um, and again, I, I would defer to the expertise of the reunification counselor as far as um, the daughter. Um, she has been adamantly opposed, I believe, the entire time to seeing her dad. And um, I think you need to tread carefully with that. Um. Do you believe at any, depending on how things go with reunification and with in-person visits and Mr. Seanborn staying clean and sober, um, and especially with the age of Gage, I believe now he is 11. Um, do you think that at any point in time before he reaches 18, that he should be able to have overnights with his father if his father stays clean and sober? Yes. Okay. 
Now, are, are you aware that there is a long-term protective order in place? Yes. And do you know how long that protective order is in place for? Uh, 2038? Is that? That would be correct. Yes. So 15 years. Um, and just to clarify for the court, one of the issues that um, Mr. Schornborn is not against there being a protective order in place or a protective order in place so that he cannot contact Mr. Schornborn for that amount of time until 2038. Um, one of his biggest contentions was the protective order does not allow him to see um, his children's games or their extracurricular activities. He's not permitted to, to go to those. Um, do you believe that if Mr. Schornborn abides by what we've discussed and stays sober and stays clean, um, he should be able to see the uh, see his children play or do their extracurriculars or go to their events, provided he not be in contact with Mr. Schornborn? Um, yes, for the most part. Okay. If you would like to elaborate, it sounds like you have some other thoughts there. Um, so at some point, if Mr. Schoenborn were to attend games like this, there would have to be some, I would believe there should be some sort of communication between the two, um, basically letting each other know who was going to be at the game and that Sometimes those those boundaries uh, set up by a protection order um, don't fit in a junior high gym. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't recall what the what the specifics of the protection order were, but many times it's like a thousand feet, uh, and I'm I'm not sure that that is even possible in some circumstances. So, okay. I would tend to agree with you, uh, Ms. Corey. So um, in reverting back and going back into the parenting plan and the phase up schedule, um, I would like to, to draw the court's attention that at phase three, which would require that phase one and two be, be completed, that um, once Mr. Schwarber reaches phase three, if the children are engaged in any sports or extracurriculars, respondent and petitioner shall have alternate attendance, which... I think would go to what you say mm -hmm. is communicating so they know who's at the game. So one of them can attend. Yes, that makes sense. Do you believe that to be fair? Yes. Okay. I don't believe I have any more questions. That does raise questions for me. Go ahead, Ms. Baldwin. <laughs> Thank you. So Ms. Corey, you think that the specific counseling um, should be sort of, uh, the children should have their own personal counselors along with a reunification counselor. Is that correct? I, yes. Okay. And then um, that Mr. needs to abide by whatever his substance use evaluation uh, recommendations are. Yes. In this case, the children witnessed the domestic violence incident. Yes. That yes. They were in fact part of it. Yes. So they're aware of the firearm. They're aware of all the significant issues that happened. Yes. Um, and that's not from somebody telling them. That's because they experienced them. Yes. Um, in this case, um, Mr. Schoenborn is asking to be able to use marijuana and alcohol as much as he wants on, say, a, a Monday, and then Tuesday have a visit. Is that reasonable given his addiction issues? No, I don't believe it is. And has Mr. Schoenborn been able to maintain sobriety? No. Does he have, to your knowledge, a clean hair follicle or even a UA today? I have. I did not see one in the court record or wasn't provided one by either party. For St. Kenna to a one-hour phone call with Mr. Schoenborn with no counseling on board, is that likely to have a positive outcome? No. You agree that the reunification counselor should essentially dictate the, the speed of reunification based on each child's individual needs? Yes, I think the reunification counselor should lead that process. And that should be child-led, meaning that each child might go at a different speed. Right. Is it harmful to the children to once again be required to engage in reunification counseling and then for Mr. to, again, use substances and sort of go restart that process multiple times. Is that harmful to the children? Yes, I believe it is. Is it reasonable to ask my client, who's the primary parent, 
to leave a sporting event during her residential time to allow Mr. Schoenborn to attend? Um, if, no, if the uh, protection order is still in place and um, spells that out specifically, she absolutely should not have to leave. Um, I would hope that the two can come to, or the court can bring the two to some sort of conclusion so that the children can have both of their parents um, there to support them. Is there historic evidence, oh, yeah. is there historic evidence that Mr. Schoenborn has been deeply involved in the children's sports? Um, there is some evidence of that. Is it limited evidence? It is. And to your knowledge, does Mr. Schoenborn have any idea of what the children are currently involved in? I do not know. Those are my questions, thank you. Ms. Holder, any other questions you might have? Just a few follow-up, thank you, Your Honor. Um, regarding the the extracurriculars and um, asking Ms. Schornborn to leave her residential, or leave an event so that Mr. Schornborn can see his children, um, would it be appropriate in your opinion for Mr. Schornborn to have um, someone with him at these events so it is not just him? Yeah, here's I, I, I don't see that that would be what the advantage of that would be. Okay. Um, and when we're talking about Ms. Schornborn's residential time, um, do you believe it would be fair for Mr. Schornborn to not be able to see any of his children's activities for another year if he's, if the reunification counselor says that the children are not ready to reunify and have in-person visits, do you believe that a reunification counselor could, um, strike that, I'm going to rephrase that one. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, did someone say something? I think, I think Ms. Rolf is unmuted, so I'm just okay. going to Is there any way in which you would recommend Mr. Schornborn be able to see his children play extracurriculars if there is a protective order in place and if it is not his residential time? Um, I believe the fairest way would be a, some sort of rotation. Um, do you believe it would be fair to have other family members um, to participate in that rotation? Um, can you clarify? For example, um, let's say that Mrs. Schornborn's mother was able to go to one of these activities and be present for the children during Ms. Schornborn's residential time. But Mr. Schornborn was also able to go to one of these events and it would not violate the protective order he has in place, or Mr. Schornborn has in place against Mr. Schornborn. So it would be Mrs. Smith, Ms. Smith could take the children to the event and Mr. Schornborn could be there also. Um, I wouldn't see an issue with that. Um, there's no protective order between Ms. Smith and Mr. Schoenborn. Okay. Okay, that's all my questions, Your Honor. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Corey. Ms. Baldwin, anyone? No, thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Um, if I may, I just had a, a couple questions for Ms. Corey oh, as no. well. Oh, yeah. no. You get to choose one one attorney to question, not two. <laughs> so I would object to that. If it's, if it's limited, I'm okay with it. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ms. Gorey, you mentioned that um, you had doubts about um, and recommended and maybe um, would like uh, Mr. Shoremorn to come to terms with his uh, substance abuse past. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you uh, mentioned that um, some sort of a group session or individual session would also be helpful. Uh, are you talking about counseling, substance abuse counseling, or? Correct. Substance abuse counseling. Um, yes, I believe that um, one of the prongs of substance abuse treatment is that group counseling and the feedback that you get in group counseling that, that doesn't come with individual counseling. Great. Well, um, were you aware that Mr. Schoenborn uh, had on his own accord in May, um, had entered um, treatment at, at the Kelso Treatment Center, and which involved both group sessions and individual sessions. 
And um, his latest report, which was uh, last Thursday, one week ago, um, gave him a, a summary progress of uh, um, uh, meeting all treatment requirements to present day and uh, continues to work his way towards the next promotion with admiral success and diligence. Now, do you think that um, such a status report in his um, substance abuse treatment would um, go a long way in, in um, your opinion of his ability to have a, a more lenient parenting plan? That's a lot to unpack. Um, so, no, I was not aware, first of all, of Mr. Schoenborn's participation, and I didn't see any record of that in the, in the court record. Um, I, I believe if he is making progress, can, can you rephrase the last part of that question? I'm so yeah, sorry. I, I apologize. That, that was a calm down question. Um, well, I guess my, my question is, um, with him, um, going to the substance abuse, uh, treatment, um, classes on his own, do you think that, would that change your opinion as to, um, what kind of, uh, restrictions or, or timeline, uh, should be in place, um, because of his history of substance abuse? Um, I, I don't hold a lot of weight that he went on his own because the uh, this was hanging out there over him. So I don't put as much stock in the fact that he went into that on his own. Um, it may as well have been a court order. Okay. And just, um, but it would carry some weight. It would. Okay. And let me just say, say that this was not, uh, to our knowledge, a court order. And I apologize, Your Honor, this was a uh, Exhibit A of our uh, settlement conference statement. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. That does, That's all I had. That does raise questions for me now. Please go ahead. So, Ms. Corey, would you be concerned that the report is dated July and our original trial date was August? Yeah, that's a little suspect. Would you be concerned that there's zero reference to a single UA being done? There's no UAs through this treatment. Yeah, I'd be there's very no concerned. Um, and are you concerned that there's no indication of any hair follicle being completed since his positive uh, hair follicle for, for fentanyl in December of 2022? Yes. And um, is this facility a uh, suboxone facility? I don't have any information. Okay. Ms. Baldwin, your question was that no, no, no hair follicle since the fentanyl positive hair follicle in December, what year? 2022, last year. Thanks. Those are my questions, Ms. Corey. Thank you. Ms. Corey, appreciate your time and input. Uh, does anybody have any concerns if Ms. Corey were to exit to exit the Zoom? No, she could be excused. I have no contention, Jar. Okay, great. Have a good day, Ms. Corey. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you. I'll have uh, call my client. Um, so, uh, Ms. Schoenborn, if you would unmute and turn your camera on. So, Ms. Schoenborn, you're asking the court to adopt um, your proposed parenting plan. Yes. Okay. And I'll have to have you speak up just a little bit more than you are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I want to take you back to um, sort of what sparked the separation. So can you tell the court about the incident that happened back in 2020? So on May 3rd was when the main incident happened the night before he had came home from work. He was upset, angry, ended up leaving again. Then I come home for quite a while. He was mad that I was asking for a chair to be built. So I went ahead and did it on my own. Then he was mad at me because I built the chair. So the next morning, I wanted to remove the chair that we had replaced it with. So I asked if he would. He wouldn't wake up. Had a long time of trying to wake him up, probably an hour or more, trying to get him just to wake up. Then he came out and passed out on the couch, still trying to get him to wake up. So I finally said, I'm just going to take it in the truck. So I asked to use a truck, and he got extremely angry, got mad, got up, went out, was slamming doors taking stuff out of the truck. I went into the garage. This is where he pinned me between the front of my Tahoe, our freezer, and wouldn't let me through. Ended up punching my Tahoe, slamming the door really hard on the garage, broke the frame. So I decided that the kids and I were leaving. We weren't going to be around. Something like that. So I told the kids to get their shoes on. They started to come out. I was trying to put my boots on and he pinned me to the ground, took the boot from me, turned around and threw it at our daughter. So he hit her with my Doc Martin boot. Kept throwing me around, it ended up at one point throwing me into the sliding glass door and I looked over and saw my son standing in our front room crying. So I told them they needed to get out of the house. They didn't need to be in there. My daughter got my son and her into our Tahoe and they were in the Tahoe and he wouldn't let me leave the house. 
He ends up throwing me around some more. He was grabbing me by my arms, threw me to the ground. And when he threw me to the ground, he told me that was my fault. And I did that to myself. I tried to stand up and leave. He was blocking our garage door. I got out finally of the house and into my Tahoe and he was pushing my door, trying to push it backwards and wouldn't let me leave. And then I text my brother and ask him to come help. And he said, if my brother shows up, there's going to be, or he's going to be sorry, or there's going to be a show along those lines. And then he said, better yet, let me show you and the kids the show. And he went for the gun. When he left the Tahoe, I shut the door and backed out. My instinct was to shut the garage door. I didn't want him coming after the kids and I. He ran out waving the gun, got the garage door open. And all I hear are my kids yelling, daddy has a gun. Daddy has a gun. Go faster, mommy, go faster than the speed limit. And we drove off. And you, um, so let's unpack that um, a little bit. Um, did both kids um, see the majority of the incident? Yes, up until they got in the Tahoe and then they saw more when he came out there. Okay. Um, and um, what about, so you mentioned um, him throwing a shoe and hitting um, your daughter. Um, did that injure her, hurt her? She got hit in the hands and it was swollen and red into the evening. And um, when you, were the children both upset? Um, you mentioned your son sort of crying as he watched the incident. Um, what were both children's emotions when they got into the Tahoe? They were upset. They were worried about even our dogs. They were worried that he was going to hurt the dogs. They were worried that he had a gun and he was coming after us with a gun. So I, they were worried for safety. And then, so um, I'm going to ask the court um, permission to share my screen. I do. Okay. Um, and so, um, Ms. Schoenborn, there was actually a video that was taken as you're sort of pulling away. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And is this the video? Yes. Okay. And then I'm just going to push play and tell us what's happening. So this is when we were backing out of the garage and I was going to take off and he's coming out with a gun. Okay. And that's the gun in his hand. Um, Ms. Schoenborn, so the video indicates um, sort of um, verifying that he did take a gun and chase after the car. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Um, and then you then contacted law enforcement. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and when did you contact law enforcement? When I was pulling out, I called through the car. I went one and drove to the sheriff's office. Okay. Um, and then in your materials, I'm going to have you turn to uh, tab 61. All right. And so, uh, Ms. Schoenborn, this um, this is the police report that was developed as a result of the incident that day. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to have you turn to where the photos start um, in, um, in that. So, all right. Very good. Um, so, looking, the first photo should be one of sort of that same surveillance photo. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and then turning from there, what's this next photo? Can you tell the court about it? So in the first photo, the green gloves in his hands, afterwards I'd watched the security camera. He had gone out and got this out of his truck. And this was before he approached me in the garage. This is what was tucked into those gloves. Okay, so you actually, or you or law enforcement pulled all the materials out from the gloves. This is from the sheriff's office laid this picture out, yes. Okay, okay. Um, and so these are Suboxone packets and some other drug paraphernalia. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And then I'll have you turn to the next page. And is this uh, a close-up of some of those materials? Yes. Okay. And in the next page, this is a prescription bottle. Yes. Yeah, so one of the sheriffs found a prescription bottle and it was only dated a few days before and it was more than halfway taken. So he had taken, I don't know exactly what quantity was in here, but he, it was way more than half taken. It was prescribed to him, but not taken the intended way. Um, and so your concern there is abuse of prescription medications. Correct. Um, I'll have to turn to the next page. Um, can you tell me about uh, this picture of a tool chest? Can you tell me about that? So the sheriff found more of the gloves, tinfoil, suboxone, prescription drugs. I think they might've found the pens in here that they said he was using. So things were found. He was hiding in there. And then I'll have you turn to the next page um, that looks like a frame. Can you tell me about that? 
This is um, the top corner. It's an upside down picture. This is the inside of the garage door, how he broke the frame from slamming it. Okay. Um, and was the frame broken prior to that incident? No. And I'll have you turn to the next picture, sort of showing a, a little bit more zoomed out picture. This is on the inside of the garage side of the door where it broke away from the wall. And that also happened that same, during that same incident? Yes. Okay. I'll have you turn to the next page. And is this just an additional picture of sort of that same door? Yes. The uh, picture after that is sort of a household um, kitchen cabinet. Tell me about that. Um, I was called back to the house to let the sheriffs in because he had ran into the house with the guns from them. And this is where they found the gun that he ran from them with. And to your knowledge, was the gun loaded? Was it unloaded? So the sheriff took it out and it was loaded and cocked. There was a bullet in the chamber. Okay. Um, and then the next um, several pictures are um, pictures of the gun as well. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And the picture right before we show the door frame again, um, again, shows the, the hammer sort of cocked and ready to be fired. Is that fair? Yes. Tell me about, there's a picture, the next picture after that is a photo of a hand. Tell me about that. This is my daughter's hand, where she got hit with the boots. Okay. Um, and you referenced that it was sore and swollen um, into the next day? Yes. Okay. Um, next picture after that, um, is this also a picture of your daughter? Yes. Okay. And this is her giving, essentially, a report to the police? Yes. And it was regarding the incident that she was also involved in. Yes. After that is of her knee. Can you tell me about that? This is my knee. Oh, it was um, okay. this is, yeah, this is when he threw me to the ground and this is the sheriff's office. And tell me about what happened to your knee during um, the altercation. So this is when I was, the kids had already left the house. I was trying to get out of the garage door of the house and he grabbed me and threw me onto the wood floors and I slid by the ways. So I hit knee first when he threw me down. Okay. And how was your knee injured? From hitting him throwing me. So I hit the wood floor. How did it feel? Was it bruised? Was oh, it? Yeah, it was pretty bruised for a couple of weeks. It got pretty big and swollen. Okay. Um, and I'll be turned to the next picture is just a closer picture of your knee. Is that right? Yes. Picture after that um, shows you and your arm. Can you tell me about that? So they took pictures of my arms because they were still red from where he had grabbed onto my arms in the house when he was throwing me around. Um, and then next picture is similar, just showing a closer picture of your arm and it being red. Yes. And similarly, same picture um, after that is just another view of your arm. Yes. And then, um, and then the next picture, same, is just another view of that same arm. Yes. Picture after that is your other arm. Is that right? Yes. Um, and then similarly, a picture after that is just a closer view of your other arm. Yes. Okay. And did both arms show this marks and redness? Yes. Okay. And is that from where he grabbed you? Yes. Um, I'll have you turn. So uh, next couple pages are just similarly pictures of that same arm. Is that right? Yes. So these are just more, I believe this one might have still had Suboxone in it. They were just more found in the garage. Okay. So these are just photos of additional Suboxone and other um, drug paraphernalia that was found. Yes. And so in this photo, um, what do you see in Mr. Schoenborn's hand in this photo? So those are the green gloves where the drugs were found. Okay. And that's uh, the next picture is just a closer view of that same still. Is that right? Yes. Um, and then um, and then finally, just additional gloves with uh, the Suboxone found inside. Yes. Next picture is a call log. Can you tell me about that? So this was when he repeatedly called me over and over. I don't remember exactly how long after the incident, but he just at night just kept calling me. Um, and was this contact wanted? No. Um, next, uh, I'll have you turn to the next uh next piece of paper. And this is a photo of um, text messages. Can you tell me about that? So when we got to the sheriff's office, they had my phone and he would, wouldn't stop texting my phone. And I, this is what was being said. Okay. Um, and were you responding to any of these? No, the sheriff's had my phone too. So they were aware what he was doing. Um, and um, they indicate that he just wants to say goodbye. Is that right? Yes, that's what it appears. 
Okay. Um, and apologizes for what happened. Yes. Okay. And so acknowledges essentially what happened. Yes. Um, did he continue to text message you going forward? This day, or do you mean after this day? Um, after this day. After this day. Not that I'm aware of on text messages, no. Okay. Did he try to communicate with you otherwise? He tried to add me on some social media and he tried to call. So ultimately you, um, ultimately Mr. Schoenborn was charged well, with yes. crimes. Yes. Okay. And so uh, Mr. Schoenborn was charged with unlawful imprisonment, domestic violence and assault and fourth degree domestic violence. Is that right, Ms. Schoenborn? Yes. Um, and then ultimately, um, at uh, tab number 55, um, he entered into the mental health court. Is that right? I agreed yes. to abide by mental health court's rules. Approximately when um, was Mr. Schoenborn released from the mental health court? I don't know the date. Okay. Was it sometime late 2022? Probably, yes. Okay. And when did you have Mr. Schoenborn um, drug tested? tested? December of 2022. And that drug test ended up being positive for fentanyl. Is that right? Yes. Okay. This is the domestic violence protection order that protects um, you. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, your goal was not to interfere with the parenting plan that the court ultimately decided. Yes. And that's why the children were left off. Correct. Um, and this is Mr. Schoenborn's um, Columbia Wellness um, substance use evaluation. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Um, and about the lower third of the page, um, it references that he's used Suboxone, heroin, and other pain pills or the drugs, that, his drug of choice. Yes. Uh, turning to the top of the next page. Um, where it says summary of findings. Um, it references that uh, Mr. Schoenborn, at least as of this report, uh, last used in May of 2020, um, but also used cannabis and alcohol on uh, in 2020 um, and results a history, it reports a history of tolerance and withdrawal. Is that right? Yes. Item number five um, on that next page, sort of in the top third, it references that um, Mr. Schoenborn has had issues with anxiety and depression. Yes. Down at item number six, it references mental health medications that Mr. Schoenborn has used. Yes. Um, and it specifically references Xanax. Was Xanax the medication that he abused that they had the prescription pill bottle picture of? Yes, and sleeping pills too. So I don't know what one's a sleeping pill on there. Okay. Um, and so in looking at dimension four risk-taking um, under that summary of findings, supportive evidence, um, it reflects that uh, Mr. Schoenborn is in the contemplation state of change, but that he's failed to control his opioid use um, over a hundred times due to, his, due to cravings and anxiety. Is that right? Yes. And um, from your knowledge and experience, that reflects sort of your knowledge and experience of Mr. Schoenborn is he's not been able to manage his addiction. Yes. Um, and then down there at summary findings, supportive evidence, it reflects that Mr. Schoenborn is at a high risk for relapse as evidenced by his continued use of opiates um, and his severe cravings. Is that right? Yes. And under dimension six, risk-taking, sort of that very first line says has, has passive support and environment. Is that right? Yes. And then on the summary findings and supportive evidence, um, sort of the last sentence of that little paragraph is that uh, Mr. Schoenborn reports having little sober support um, as his one close friend drinks regularly. Yes. Has that been your experience during your marriage was that Mr. Schoenborn didn't have a lot of sober friends? Yes. Turning to the next page, it says DSM-5 diagnosis, right sort of in the middle of the page. And Mr. Schoenborn was diagnosed as having an opioid use disorder severe, as well as an alcohol use disorder moderate. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, and then down towards the bottom of that page, it also recommends mental health counseling. Yes. 
I'm going to have you turn to uh, the next exhibit, exhibit number 44. And this is a Columbia Wellness Report for you and the kids within about a week of the incident. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and why did you take the kids to counseling? Because it's it was a traumatic event. It was something that nobody should go through, let alone kids. They needed somebody to talk to. They needed something to help them get through what happened. Okay. And um, was what happened, was that challenging for you as well? Yes, it was. Okay. And so did you seek out um, supports for yourself as well? Yes. Okay. Um, do you feel like you've appropriately worked through mental health counseling to achieve a, a reasonable result? Yes, I do. Um, how long did Kenna spend in counseling? Kenna was in counseling all the way up until recently. She tried counseling on her own. She's tried to go to the beginning of reunification counseling. So she's made an effort and she's been doing it for, I and mean, she did it regularly for quite a while. Okay. And why, why did she stop counseling? Really, it came down to reunification counselor reached out and said that it wasn't going to continue. Okay. Um, and was that in part because Mr. Schoenborn had returned to using uh, illegal substances? Yes. Okay. Um, and Gage also engaged in counseling? Yes. And that's reflected in this report as well as, um, um, and you took them additional times. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. I'm going to have you turn to tab number 45. Is this a letter reflecting uh, Mr. Schoenborn's um, additional diagnosis? Yes. And this one uh, references panic disorder, mood disorder, depressive type, and opioid use disorder. And this one uh, also peace health at the top. Um, this is a separate um, diagnosis that also references uh, adjustment disorder. Yes. And that's for Mr. Schoenborn. Um, this is a letter that Kenna's counselor wrote. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and it references the fact that Kenna essentially went to reunification once and then was um, pretty opposed to returning. Yes. Um, and that Kenna had specific uh, memories other than the incident of her father not being emotionally or physically present in her life. Yes. Um, and specifically, she recalled her father being in the garage um, instead of attending her soccer games. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. And the garage is where you found a lot of the drug paraphernalia after the incident. Yes. Um, the report references that Ken has become apathetic um, and irritable since um, her supervised visit with her father. Yes. And Kenna, after that, didn't attend any further reunification. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and so at this point, other than a single visit, Kenna hasn't seen her father since the incident. Correct. About two years or so, close to two years after the incident. Um, and in this report, um, Kenna indicates that she's um, had a number of sessions with this therapist. Is that fair? Yes. Um, but that she doesn't doesn't have any interest in seeing or speaking with her father. Yes. Um, and down at the bottom, it indicates that um, children like Kenna um, thrive and need a safe and nurturing environment with consistent and predictable caregivers. Yes. And that Kenna needs a sense of control because she was a part of that domestic violence um, situation. Yes. Okay. Um, but that Kenna has maintained healthy attachments with you and other people um, in your family. Yes. Uh, um, so in December of 2022, uh, you yes. asked Mr. Schoenborn to complete a hair follicle test. Is that right? Yes. And Mr. Schoenborn, when you asked him to do that hair follicle, he did. Yes. Is that right? And yes. he tested positive for fentanyl. Yes. Um, and uh, if you look down at the confirmation cutoff, confirmation cutoff is about 100 parts per milligram. And Mr. Schoenborn had 2,673 parts per milligram. Since this test, 
did you subsequently ask Mr. Schoenborn to engage in another test to see if he was still using? Yes. Okay. Um, and just one moment. And so when you asked Mr. Schoenborn to complete that test in May, did he ever show up? No. Oh. Since his positive hair follicle test in December of last year, has Mr. Schoenborn provided a clean hair follicle indicating he stopped using? No. Has he even provided a UA to indicate even he could stay clean for a couple days? No. All right. The, um, so you have significant concerns as to Mr. Schoenborn's ability to stay clean and sober. Yes. Gage did engage in reunification counseling. Is that right? Yes. yes. Um, what was it like for Gage when visits stopped in December due to his father's continued drug use? I, I it's sad to say, I don't think it affected him as much as you would assume he's doing great. He's, is Gage um, willing, excited to re-engage with his father or is it is that sort of, it didn't impact him very much because he's a little um, jaded? He doesn't talk about his dad. Okay. okay. What about Kenna? At this point, I said Kenna's not in counseling at this point, hasn't seen her father in years. Uh, what is Kenna's interest in reunification? She has no interest in reunification. As your primary concern that the children don't essentially start this process and get pulled back and forth um, with Mr. Schoenborn, sort of getting clean for a period and then failing again. Yes. The, in looking at your parenting plan, um, you're asking for the finding of um, child abuse due to Kenna being involved in the um, altercation and being assaulted um, by having the boot thrown at her. Yes. Okay. Um, you're also asking for a finding of an emotional and physical problem um, because Mr. Schoenborn has um, several confirmed diagnoses that indicate he has underlying mental health issues that are not being addressed. Yes. And those are in addition to the findings that are agreed. Yes. As far as the limitations on uh, Mr. Schoenborn, you don't believe it's appropriate for him to drink alcohol at any time, given his confirmed diagnosis for substance use as a, with alcohol. Correct. It's not appropriate at any time. And similarly, you don't agree that it's appropriate at any time for him to use just trade out alcohol for a different substance and start using marijuana or spice or something along those lines. No, not appropriate. Um, as far as the psychological evaluation, you're asking the court to order that for Mr. Schoenborn so that he can get treatment for his underlying mental health disorders. Yes. In looking at your um, recommended phase in schedule, um, you are recommending a phase in schedule. Yes. You're asking that Mr. Schoenborn uh, do his evaluations and complete his treatment before starting um, with reunification. Yes. And is that because we've already been down this road? Um, and it's not reasonable to sort of repeatedly cycle the children through your reunification. Yes. And then once Mr. Schoenborn is clean and sober, um, you're asking for that to be for a period of a year. Yes. And then if he's clean and sober, he would then start um, visits through a reunification process. Yes. Um, and that reunification process would largely be controlled by the reunification expert. Correct. Right and that the children and Mr. Schoenborn should each have their own personal counselors along with a reunification expert. Yes. If Mr. Schoenborn just called Kenna out of the blue today, how would that go? Not well. Um, and so you're asking for phone calls to not begin essentially until the reunification counselor thinks it's appropriate. Correct, yes. And not put the cart before the horse and do calls before there's been any kind of reunification. Right. Um, similarly, when it comes to sports, um, was Mr. Schoenborn involved in the children's sporting activities prior to the separation? No. Um, and um, to your knowledge, has he followed any of their sporting activities, even from afar, since then? Not that I'm aware of. Um, what sports is Kenna involved in? 
kind of plays premier soccer. And would it be disturbing to kind of to just have Mr. Schoenborn show up on a sideline? Yes. Would that ruin her experience? Yes. Okay. Should that not happen until a reunification counselor says it's appropriate? Yes. Um, and is soccer something that provides kind of with a lot of benefits and um, mentally and physically? Yes. Okay. What about Gage? What is Gage involved in? Gage is doing Kelsey Youth Football right now. Okay. Um, and similar questions for Gage. Would Gage be concerned um, or upset if Mr. Schoenborn just showed up on a sideline? Yes. And similarly, you're just asking that the reunification counselor dictate when Mr. Schoenborn can be present. Yes. And that that effectively be also child-led when the kids are ready for that. Yes. Um, the, uh, let's talk a little bit about personal property. Um, Mr. Schoenborn is going to ask um, for some personal property. What happened with all of your personal property sort of in the weeks and months after separation? A lot of it was packed up. There was his, the whole house was gone through the garage, the shop, and the or the shed in the back and loaded up in his truck, delivered to him, as well as a second truck delivered to his dad. Okay. And so you essentially boxed up all of the things that belong to Mr. Schoenborn and either gave them to a brother or had your brother deliver them? Yes, my brother delivered them. Okay. Um, and to your knowledge, is there anything left of Mr. Schoenborn's at the house? No. Okay. Mr. Schoenborn is going to ask for a whole host of firearms to be returned to him. What's your concern about that? Safety. I mean, what would your concern be if Mr. Schoenborn is awarded um, or provided with um, eight, 10 firearms? That he would use them on us. Is that based on your experience? Yes. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, um, who do the guns that you have in your house, who do they belong to? Were they bought during the community did, or during the marriage? Did they come into the, um, into the marriage um, sort of a handful at a time? Tell me about how you acquired them. They were bought throughout our marriage. Um, and has anybody else, to your knowledge, stored guns at your home that that weren't yours or Mr. Schoenborn's? No. Um, and then finally, you're asking for an attorney fee award. Yes. And you've had to spend a significant amount in attorney fees. Is that right? Yes. And that's been through a number of hearings to um, address the issues of Mr. Schoenborn uh, using. Um, drugs and alcohol? Yes. And so that's required multiple hearings? Yes. And there's been many child support hearings? Yes. And those were uh, several contempt hearings? Yes. And that's for Mr. Schoenborn not paying uh, support as ordered? Yes. And that cost you fees? Yes. Um, Mr. Schoenborn makes significantly more than you do? Yes. So you're asking for a substantial award of fees? Yes. Um, and the attorney fee affidavit was provided to the court as part of the trial aid, um, including today's hearing. Anticipation is somewhere around uh, $45,000 between myself and prior counsel has been spent to get here today. And this case has been pending. We're now sitting at three years. So this has been a, a long, a long case as well. Um, fair to, and you're just asking for those to be awarded out of the West Rock pension along with the other transfer payment. Yes. Thank you. Um, that takes care of my questions. Ms. Holder is going to ask you a few questions. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the history of your marriage to begin with. How long were you married um, to Nick? How long have you been married? We were almost married 11 years before the incident. And how long have you guys been together total? I was 14 when we got together, so almost 20 years. And... What was your relationship like prior to May of 2020? It's always been a hard, rocky relationship with his drug use. And how long, to your knowledge, had he been using drugs? Since Kenna was born. And I mean, prior in high school, but really knew about it since Kenna was born in 2010. And there was a period where he was sober for nine years. Is that correct? No. Did he have surgery in 2019? It was earlier than 2019. Do you remember what like year it was? 17, 2018. Do you remember what it was for? He had surgery on his nose. He had surgery on his knee. Okay. Um, why did he have surgery on his knee? He tore his 
ACL, or it's not his ACL, his, um, some, something in his knee. Was it his meniscus? Yes. Okay. Do you remember how he did that? Um, at the gym, the first time, the second time he slipped at work, he said. And you said that he was not actively engaged in the children's lives. Correct. Uh, what was his job during the course of the marriage? He was an IME supervisor. And how much was he working? To my knowledge, he went to work early, came home late. How many hours a week would you say that he was at work? With what I knew, he would leave at four in the morning and come home 530 to six. And do you know what kind of job duties he had? He was a supervisor. Did he ever respond to emergencies? Rarely, sometimes. Ever have late night calls with his supervisor? Occasionally. Um, during the event on May 3rd of 2020, you said that um, he was sleeping a lot. Is that correct? Yes. And that's what initiated it. Do you remember what he was doing the day before? He was at work. Um, do you remember if, uh, what he was specifically doing at work the day before? Do you remember if they were, I'm sorry, just normal work. Do you remember if he had any conference calls? No. Were there any emergencies? No. How do you know that? How would I know? You say he was sleeping late. What time did you try to wake him up? 10, 11. How'd you try to wake him? By going in the room and asking him to wake up. Did you yell at him to wake up or just ask him? Did not yell at him. I asked him to wake up. Um, in the course of your marriage, had there been any, there had never been any domestic violence, had there? No. The police had never been called before. Correct. There had never been any issue of domestic violence involving the children either. Is that correct? Correct. And you say that a shoe was thrown at Kenna. Yes. And this was deliberate. Yes. How do you know that Nick saw her to throw the shoe at her? When he ripped it out of my hands, he turned around. As she's standing there and threw a shoe at her. Do you think he was aware of his actions throughout the entire incident? Yes. And how do you know that? I don't know. He's an adult. You would assume that you're aware of your actions. Were you aware of what was going on the entire time of the incident? Yes. In the police reports, you said that you originally, you said that you were worried Nick was going to hurt himself. Correct. And you also, a few days later, said that when you went back and looked at the tape, you then realized he wanted to hurt you and the kids. Yes. But you didn't realize it in the moment. Not in the moment, because I was worried about my kids getting them out of there, not thinking that my husband or their father would do that to us until I watched the video and saw him cock the gun and come towards us with the gun. Do you believe he was high during that incident? I'm unaware. Did he shoot at you? He did not shoot the gun. Are you aware your mother made statements saying that Nick tried to shoot your children and you? My mother was not at the seen when it happened. But are you aware she made those statements? No. Are you aware that it was submitted as a declaration to the court previously? Stating that he tried to shoot us? Yes. Or he intended to shoot us? That he tried to shoot you? I believe there was something submitted. I don't know if it was those exact words. Um, how long have you been working at Red Canoe? Almost two years. 
And when did you start? October 6th of 21. And what was the date that Nick showed up in the drive through at Red Canoe? That was in December of 21, I believe. So he showed up there two months later? Correct. Did you or your attorney ever let him know you were beginning a job there? Yes. And how did you make him and the attorney at the time aware? My attorney had reached out to his provided. I mean, I've turned over pay stubs. He's aware that I worked there. His mom had come in prior to that to the bank. I don't I mean, my attorney let his attorney know. Was he, um, did you and Nick bank at Red Canoe prior to that incident? I have had an account with Red Canoe since I was a kid. He was put on my account for the time of our marriage. He was put on my original account, yes. So he had been on a Red Canoe account for approximately seven years at that point? It was added in 2006. Were you aware that Nick was taking anti-anxiety medication during your marriage? Off and on, yes. How did you feel about that? When he misused it, I had issues with it. How did you know he misused it? His actions, the way he acted, the way he was really out of it and not present. Um, Can you explain that a little bit? Like, what does that mean he was out of it? Like falling asleep, not waking up, doing weird behaviors, sweating a lot, not acting normal, but not sure if it was a cover up for other use. I don't know. When you say he wasn't acting normal, what did it look like to you when he was acting normally? That was a long time ago, so I'm not really sure what normal is for him. So I want to take you kind of back to like the beginning of your marriage. And you said that, you know, it's been rocky at some parts. Um, but at some point, did you ever kind of have an idea of what normal was for him? Probably before we got married. And what was that? What was his, what was his behavior like when you think he was acting normally? That was when he was more going to school, doing sports and things. Okay. What kind of sports did he do? Um, he played football in high school, did track for a while. So when you said that whenever he was using his behavior changed and he would get sweaty, what other kind of things, what other behaviors did he display while he was using that you know of? Aggression, just snappy. Was didn't know what I would get when I talked to him or how he would react or treat me. What kind of fights did you guys have or what did you fight about? His drug use and his drinking. Um and to your knowledge, he was doing that through the course of the entire relationship, and he was never sober for nine years. It would trade it up. So got bad with alcohol, drugs, back and forth. Um, do you know if he ever went to therapy? I never had proof he did anything. Did he ever tell you he went to therapy? Before we got married, or right after we got married when Ken was born, he said he did. And... To your knowledge, was he ever, during the course of your marriage, was he ever diagnosed with anxiety or depression? I don't know if he's officially diagnosed with it. Did he ever tell you he was? He had medicine for it. So he he told you, I have medication for anxiety and depression. Correct. Did you guys ever have conversations about how that affected him in your marriage, him believing that he had anxiety and depression? Not specific conversations, no. Um, so while you guys were married, did you ever talk about each other's mental health? Not really, no. Why not? We weren't together a lot. It was his thing. I was the mom to the kids. When you say it was his thing, what do you mean? He did his work and his own stuff. I took care of the kids. And what was your job during the course of your marriage before you worked at Red Canoe? I started doing volunteer work at the schools when my kids were in school. 
volunteered and then ended up working as a para for a short time at the schools before I had to get a full-time job. And why did you have to get a full-time job? Because he was unemployed and I had to support my kids. Okay. And was he unemployed during your marriage or this is after you filed for divorce? Right after. Okay. So during the course of your marriage, he was doing his own thing and working his job and you were, um, what is your job title? Currently? Um, while, while you were married, uh, was it like a teacher's assistant? Um, I was a, like a booster's parent. So I volunteered a lot. And then I was in the special education as a resource. Okay. Did you, did you enjoy doing that? I enjoyed being at the schools on the same schedule as a kid. Yes. Okay. Um, did you work out that arrangement with Nick so that you could do that? And then he would work full-time to support you? No. So you never had that discussion? No. So what were your money discussions like? We didn't have a whole lot of money discussions. I paid the bills. Um, what kind of what kind of budgeting did you guys do? We just had money so we could afford our bills. We didn't have a lot of bills. We didn't have strict budgeting. Okay. Um, when you guys were discussing uh, finances during your marriage, what did those conversations look like? We didn't have a lot of financial discussions during our marriage. Well, um, we were lucky enough that we didn't have to worry about finances. We didn't have bills. We had our house and a car. Okay. Uh, what kind of things did you guys talk about while you were married? While well, things were good. I don't know if we had a good marriage, so I don't remember talking about things when things were good. Okay. What about before you were married? We were young and in high school. And how old were you? How old were you two when you got married? I was 22 when we got married. And how old were you when you had Kenna? 23. And from the time you had Kenna, um, did you did you work or anything like that after you had her, or was it just the being a, a booster's parent? I've been a I've been a stay at home mom until I was a booster parent to Para, and then just two years ago full time for the first time. Okay. And was Nick working that, that whole time, full time, as soon as you both became parents? Yes. Um, and he went to school also, correct? Um, he got a, a degree? He went to Perry Tech, and I worked two jobs while he was at Perry Tech before we got married. Okay. And what was your relationship like while he was in school and you were working two jobs? Wasn't the best. Okay. Um, why wasn't it the best? He was using at that time, too drinking a lot. It was the same. I mean, the same arguments throughout the marriage were then drinking and drug use. Um, and while he was going to school and you were working two jobs, was there ever any kind of an arrangement made where you support me while I'm in school? And then as soon as I get a job, I'll help support you. I mean, there wasn't official, but that's kind of how it worked. Okay. Um, so you're saying it wasn't official. So did you ever talk about that's how it was going to work? Oh, so before, so I was going to object, and I know that's unusual in this process, but we have a limited amount of time, and these seem to be financial questions when that's all been agreed to. So I guess I, unless it's somehow related to the things that are at issue, I'm not sure where we're going. I'll move on from that. That's that's okay, Ms. Baldwin. Okay. I understand. Um, so throughout the course of your marriage, uh, you said it was rocky, but there was no, no DV. There was no domestic violence. Correct. Um, no domestic violence against the kids? Not until May 3rd. Okay. Um, when's the last time you've heard from Mr. Schornborn directly? What do you mean by directly? That he has spoken to you. May 3rd. Um, so that, when it comes to the, when it comes to the crazy word, right here when it comes to the protective orders, he hasn't contacted you directly. Verbally. I haven't spoke to him verbally. Okay. Um, in April of 2022, you were held in contempt, correct? Correct. And you were held in contempt because you were not getting Kenna to reunification counseling. I was taking Kenna. Kenna was not going. Did you ever work with Kenna to ask her to go to reunification counseling and encourage it? I believe the kids have their say. They were there. They witness it. They have their own feelings. They need to work through their own problems before he's pushed onto them. So I have supported both of my kids. 
Okay. So if a court order was put in place with this parenting plan for reunification, would you encourage your children to engage in reunification counseling? I've always taken them. Would you encourage them? Taking them is take, I don't understand by encourage them. I can't force her to do anything. Okay. So you physically take the kids to reunification counseling? Yes, I did. And what happens when you get there and they say, I don't want to do this, mom? They've gone in and they do the counseling with their counselors. What do you anticipate will happen? What do you anticipate will happen from today going forward if the children are supposed to go see a reunification counselor, you physically take them to the counseling center and they refuse to get out the car? How will you react? She's 13 years old. I'm going to tell her, you know, we're here. You're supposed to go. What else am I supposed to do? And what would you do with Gage? The same thing. He's almost taller than me, too. And he's 11 years old. You take them. Ask them. I mean, last time they told me I was supposed to force them out of my car. I'm not going to force my kids out of the car. Who told you you were supposed to force them? It came from Nick's attorney, Chad Zandy. And... You previously mentioned that uh, Mr. Schornborn had been found in contempt for not paying child support. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Was he, was he employed at this time? No. He was unemployed. And when he was unemployed, he then got, um, the court paused his child support payments. Is that correct? I don't know. Is it true that the reunification stopped because the counselor concluded that until you and your mother were supportive that there would be no progress? No, I've never heard that. Do you believe your mom is supportive of fostering a relationship with Nick and your children? I don't talk to my mom about that, so I'm unaware. What do you talk with your mom about? Normal stuff that's going on in my life now with me. Oh. You're saying that during the course of the marriage, while Nick was working full time, um, he never was engaged with the children. Correct. So he was never a coach for them? A uh, primary coach for the kids? No, he was not a coach for the kids. When you say primary coach, what do you mean? A dad who stands on the sideline and tries to coach is not a coach. So he did go to the games? Some of the games, yes. Previously, you said he didn't go to any of the games. He would show up to some of the games. What kind of games would he show up to? I remember T-ball when Ken was really little. Recently, he came to some of Gage's football games when they're on his visit time and some basketball games on Gage's visit time. You previously testified that he didn't go to any of their games prior to the, the divorce proceedings. When was he a sideline dad coach? When Kenna played T-ball and when Gage played T-ball. And Kenna played T-ball before the divorce? Yes. Um, did you ever yell at Nick? I'm sure I've yelled at Nick. Okay. Do you ever remember yelling at him during the May 3rd incident? No, I did not yell at him during the May 3rd incident. Are either of your children open to seeing their father? I think it's harder this time around. I don't think Kenna is. And I think Gage is a little more reserved. Okay. Um, when you say Gage is a little more reserved, what do you mean? His dad's done this to him a couple of times now. So he's growing up, he's seeing what his dad's doing and he's making his own opinions. Okay. Do your children have any relationship with, uh, with Nick's parents? No. Um, and just to be, the protective order that's currently in place, um, neither one of his parents are in that protective order, correct? Correct. Why are, prior to the May 20th incident and filing for divorce, were they engaged and active in their lives? No. So they never went to go visit at their house, at his dad's house? The, his dad came to our house? Either one. They have visited them, yes. Were they engaged? No. So they never went to any of their, their games or anything like that? They have showed up, but they were not engaged. Okay. To you being engaged, what does that mean? No, my kids actually knowing who you are. 
instead of having to ask, is that your mom? Is that this? Or asking the name of the grandparent. That's, I mean, the kids should know who their grandparents are. That's being engaged. So, so if your children would have seen Nick's parents, they would say, who are those people? They wouldn't know? No, that they're older. They probably know. Do they know their names? I don't know. If there was a, a phase in parenting program or in the parenting plan, and it would be it was and it's put in place, um, and both sides can agree to it, or the judge rules on it. How would you make sure that you follow it? I've always followed the parenting plans. They've always been where they needed to be for drop offs. They've done their counseling. What they choose as their own self and their counselors releasing that's out of my hands. So, what kind of conversations do you have with them about their father? We don't have conversations about their father. Have you ever had conversations with them during this process about their father? I mean, I had to tell Gage that he couldn't see his dad anymore. Kenna knows that she's had to go to counseling for reunification for her dad. Just things that they have to know is all that they know. Okay. Um, and having those conversations with the kids um, and you tell them, you know, I'm sorry, Gage, you can't see your dad anymore. Does he ever ask why? I told Gage why. Gage was aware. I told him why. I mean, this is my kid that's being hurt. So I care for my kid. So when he asked questions in that situation, I told Gage why. And what did you tell him specifically? That his dad failed a drug test and that visits were not going to happen until his dad could be clean. Okay. And did you ever um, talk to your kids about, you know, the drugs that Nick was using or what addiction is or what addiction recovery is? After the incidents, my kids have taken and watched and done drug safety. So they're aware of what drugs are and what they do to you. Yes, for their safety. Okay. And have you ever been engaged with them or talked with them after their counseling visits to, to further talk about what they saw at counseling? I have asked them how it's gone, but I also do feel like if they want to tell their counselor something, that's between the counselor and them. I don't need to make them think they have to tell me everything that goes on in there. Okay. Um, are there any other areas of your children's lives where like school, for example, and then you ask them how school's going and they just say, it's fine. Do you ever follow up with them to find out what that means? Yes. Okay. Um, what kind of follow-up questions do you ask? What they did that day, what they're learning, things that were fun. And so have you ever had those kind of conversations related to their counseling? I feel like their counseling is their time. If they want to go in and talk about things that are bugging them, that they didn't want to come tell me, there's a reason. So their counseling is their time to talk to a counselor and to get the most that they can out of their counseling. Okay. I don't need and to make them feel like they can't say something because they have to tell me. Right. Um, have they ever told you what happens to counseling? Yes, there's been times Kenna has told me yes. Okay. And without getting to the specifics of what she said during counseling, how do you have those conversations with her when that's a private con conversation between her and her counselor, but she wants to talk with you about it? How do you handle those? And I'm supportive and I listen okay. to her and I let her know that she has her own opinions and what makes her happy. Okay. And so you always encourage your children's happiness. Yes. Okay. So if it eventually gets to the point where they would be happy to see your father, would you support that? Yes. If that's what they want and it's a healthy, safe environment and he has proven to not be on drugs. I don't have any more questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, so when the kids played t-ball, they were about three. Is that fair? Three, four years old? Yes. Okay. And so we're talking about a decade ago. Yes. Okay. And so that's the that's the the very brief time period where he was that you said sort of parent that was yelling on the sideline. Yes. Okay. Um when Gage engage, when Gage was uh, doing the reunification process, you supported Gage as he worked through that process. Yes. But Gage and Kenneth were two different kids who had two different reactions. Is that fair? Yes. Um, and in fact, Gage went all the way to a period of unsupervised visits. Correct. Um, until um, the positive fentanyl test. Yes. You provided the children with safety education and training so that they would not touch or accidentally consume uh, drugs such as fentanyl. Correct. Um, and based on the children's sizes now as teens and preteens, um, are they essentially your size or bigger? My daughter is bigger and my son's pretty much my size. Is there any ability for you to physically force either of them to do much of anything at this point? 
So the only thing you can do is essentially tell them that this is what was ordered. This is what you need to do. This is what's happening. Correct. And historically, that's not been a problem with either child. Except for Kenna, who had a brief period there, she was really struggling. Yes. All right, nothing further on. Thanks, Ms. Holder. Um, Ms. Shornborn, um, you previously mentioned that you had been in counseling. What kind of counseling have you had? I did counseling after the incident and went through that with him and then was told that I didn't need to continue to do counseling. And you said you did it with them. Did you do individually counseling or just with the children? Them, I met Columbia Wellness. Okay. I did counseling um, with the kids and on my own. Okay. And how long did you go for counseling on your own? Probably six to eight months. Okay. Um, are you aware of what AA or NA is? Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous? I've heard of them. Okay. Have you ever heard of the companion programs they have for like family members of addicts and family members of alcoholics? No. So you've never, I'm assuming since you haven't heard of that before that you've never been to one of those um, group sessions. Correct. Okay. If you had known about them during the course of your marriage, do you think that is something that you would have looked into? Depending on the time frame of it, maybe. Okay. Um, why depending on the time frame? Because I got to a point where I was just a single mom and I was just there to take care of my kids. Okay. Um, let's say that one or both of your children want to reunify with Nick and he is able to abide by the, the phase up in the parenting plan. Is going to um, a support group for family members or people who know um, addicts or alcoholics, is that something you'd be willing to do? If it meant that you were able to better speak to your children about what it's like having a father who's an addict or an alcoholic. I will do what I need to to support my kids, not Nick, but my kids. Okay. Um, so if that would be helpful for supporting your children, would you do it? If it comes to a point to support my kids. Okay. Um, would you do it voluntarily? I don't really get where you're going with. If it would be helpful for the kids to be able to talk with you about what it's like to have a family member who is a recovering addict, if going to sessions like that would be helpful for you to be able to understand your children and what they're going through and to be able to have those conversations, is that something that you would be willing to do? Yes. Said that you supported Gage throughout the reunification counseling. So I know that we at length talked about Kenna. Um, what about Gage? So he, he would go to reunification counseling, correct? Yes. Um, to what extent did you support him in going? I always told him that it's what he wants, how he feels, if he feels safe, and that I would support him and I would take them and be there for him if he ever needed me. Okay. Um, when he would finish up his reunification sessions, he would come back home to you, correct? Yes. Did you, how was his demeanor after those, those counseling sessions? So reunification, he was yes. okay. He was okay after reunification. Okay. How was he after he got to see his dad for supervised and unsupervised visits? That was harder. He had more, more issues, more struggles. Okay. And what do you mean by that? He was upset and not happy when he would first come back. And did he say, why was he unhappy or upset when he first came back? He didn't know why he would feel that way. Did he ever go to counseling to help him work through those feelings? Yes. Okay. Um, how much counseling did he get to help with those feelings? He started right away and he did a few years of counseling on his own. Okay. At Columbia and, and how do you feel like he did after that counseling? He was fine until he got visits with his dad and then it was hard again. So just so I'm clear, there were multiple times and different times that he went to, to counseling. He continuously went to counseling. So he would go and be fine. See his dad would be hard again. Okay. And that was during the same time that he was at counseling and see his dad. Yes, they were two totally separate things. Okay. I took them to counseling um, think, on my own. Okay. Do you think the counseling was helpful? Yes. Okay. And did you find counseling for yourself to be helpful as well? Yes. Great. I have no further questions. Ms. Baldwin? That didn't raise any for me. Okay, thanks. 
Right. Any additional folks, Ms. Bolton, you'd like to present? No, the agreement is, is that just the JAL and each party. Great. All right. So we'll turn the time to, to Ms. Holder. Ms. Holder. Okay. Um, if I might have one second to confer with my client before. Sure, that's fine. Okay. If we could just take five minutes, that would be all I need. Okay. This time, I'd like to uh, bring Nick on. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so first, I'd like to start talking with you about, you know, what was your marriage like? Um and what your relationship was like prior to the domestic violence incident. Um, so how would you describe your relationship with, with Ms. Shulman? Prior to the domestic violence incident? Yes. Uh, it was it was rocky. I mean, I agree with her on that. And not a lot of communication or openness. Um, we were more focused on, I guess, goals, you know, house, money, cars, than, uh, yeah, talking about, feelings or stuff like that um when you say that there wasn't a lot of emphasis on talking about feelings what do you mean um it just wasn't something we did at all i uh she didn't like to talk about it um and i got uncomfortable with time trying to talk to her about it okay um how many times throughout the course of your marriage do you think you tried to talk to her about how you feel through the almost 20 years I, a lot mm-hmm. And put a number on it a lot okay um and how did that impact you emotionally uh it, it was tough um we didn't uh like she said we didn't have a lot of friends it was always us and then us with the kids and we did every everything together besides when i was at work and so there wasn't any like uh anyone else to talk to or support okay. um were you looking for support uh yes okay what kind of support were you looking for in the marriage uh, just somebody to talk to and understand. Um, okay. uh, did, yeah. you, did you ever go to any kind of therapy while you were married? Yes. Okay. What kind of therapy did you go to? Um, uh, met with a psychiatrist and a therapist, um, got diagnosed with uh, depression and anxiety, um, got on medication therapy, and also went and saw the therapist regularly to kind of talk about, uh, you know, why, I guess. Okay. Um, how long did you do that? Uh, it was off and on through the marriage. Um, I probably three different times, two or three different times. You went three times to therapy or there were three different kind of times times that I actually went, uh, Yeah, not three times, but like a, you know, 15 times once and then 10 times the next. And, you know, then they stopped. Do you remember when you started going to therapy? Like about what year it was? Uh, Yeah, it was 2010, 2011 was the very first time when I was trying to get help. Okay. And why did you seek out help? Even earlier than that, probably. Um, I was the, the depression and anxiety. I didn't understand kind of what it was at the time, but I knew I wasn't, uh, I wasn't right or normal or feeling myself. Um, a lot of stress. Can you can you explain that? Like, what do you, what do you, what are your symptoms that led you to believe that you had an anxiety, depression, or therapy, and what led, or sorry, anxiety, so and depression, and what led what, you to getting treatment? Yeah, what got me to call was the panic attacks and um, stuff like that. Uh, when I start thinking about stuff that worries me or that I, uh, you know, like failed at, um, I <clears throat> started to breathe. Um, you know, my chest tightens up. I get shaky. Um, if I'm driving, I, I have to pull over. I mean, I basically shut down. It's. And how long have you suffered from those type of panic attacks? Uh, like the 2009 10-ish all the way till uh, after the incident. Okay. Do you know if or what triggers panic attacks for you? Um, not uh, letting her down letting the family down, uh, feeling like I'm not good enough. Uh, and then fighting, like when we fought, it would be triggered. What kind of things did you guys fight about? Uh, everything from uh, ordering food to buying the wrong faucet for the kitchen sink. So you would fight a lot? A lot. Were you guys happy? You said it was rocky. What was, when you were happy, what was it like when you guys were happy together? Uh, We were the happiest, I think, when we were, like, succeeding in our goals. 
like so the money was good we you know had the kid getting the house uh and so there wasn't a lot to like uh argue about and so you say you talked did you guys talk when we were happy did right. you guys talk about goals um as far as like when I went to Perry Tech and she worked, she helped me through that time. Um, you know, I did have unemployment, but she had to work to get us through that, knowing that once I got a job, I knew how much she wanted to be a mother and be able to spend as much time with their kids as possible. And so the whole idea was I get a job that can support both of us without her having to work. It wasn't that she couldn't, you know, it was her choice, but I wanted her to have a choice. Okay. And so you were supportive of her wanting to be a stay-at-home mom? Supportive? Is that what you said? Yeah, you were supportive yes. of that. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And um, and so for her to be a stay-at-home mom, did that mean that you were going to be gone working a lot? Uh, yes. I mean, I didn't know that at Peritech as much, but even before Peritech, I was gone a lot. And so it's over the years, I've found that the more money you want to make, the more time you have to dedicate to your job. Yes. Okay. And did your time at your job put a strain on your marriage? Uh, absolutely. I was... When I was supervisor for all those years, um, I got called in a lot, like during the nights, I worked a lot of weekends. I'd have to like for soccer games, I'd have to go in on the weekend, check in at work, sneak out, drive to Portland, hit the soccer game, then drive back to work, check back in, um, you know, and hope nothing went wrong when I was gone. Um, so it did strain. I, I knew she didn't like me gone that much. Right. Okay. Um, what were your role? What were your job roles? Like, what did you do as a supervisor? Um, so I had, uh, it varied, but I had 22 employees that I would uh, have to provide work for, manage, um, you know, deal with their at work and personal problems. Um, I also filled in for my boss and sometimes his boss's boss. So I would be taking calls for the whole mill. Um, I, I did a little bit of everything, but I was I was highly involved with the mill. And when you say we're taking calls, what what times were you taking calls? Anytime. It could be 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And did that ever happen? Uh, yes. How often were you taking, you know, like after traditional work hour calls? I'm maybe once a week. So it, it happened frequently. Oh, yeah. Um, throughout the course of your work there? Um, how long did you work there and how long were you a supervisor? Um, I worked there for almost 11 years. I was a supervisor for like seven of those years. Was it stressful? Yeah, it was really stressful. Why was it stressful for you? Uh, it was just a lot more people uh, depending on me and the workload was a lot more than when I was on the hourly side and I just, you know, went to work for my eight hours or 10 hours or whatever I was assigned to come home. And so I brought you know, you bring work home with you a lot, worried about the next day, you know, filling positions when guys call in sick, uh, something breaks down. You're the one that's responsible for that until it's running. You're losing a lot of money when it is down. During the point that you were supervisor for those seven years um, and you, you t admittedly took home, work home with you, did you ever have those discussions with Mr. Warborn? Yeah, we talked a bunch about like my on-call weekends um, when I'd have to, you know, we're getting ready for bed and then I got called and say I have to go to work. Um, and we talked enough that I knew she didn't like me leaving so much. But at the same time, we also talked about money and wanting to have enough to, <clears throat> you know, maybe get a newer house, newer cars, you know, like we have been. Did you ever, did you guys ever talk about maybe getting a job that wasn't as stressful for you? No, it was always about maybe getting a more higher paying job that would have led to more stress. But. Um, so how did you cope with the stress of your job and your home life? Not well at all. Um, I basically just tried to toughen up and ignore it as much as I could. And how long did you do that? Uh, for 11 years. Um, now, you admittedly have used um, alcohol and drugs beginning in your teenage years. Is that right? Yes. Um, was there any point that you stopped? Uh, yeah. I mean, you kind of grow out of that, you know, I mean, the occasional high school party and stuff, and then you grow out of it, and then you get back into it. But 2011, um, once... 
I finally got sober, I stopped for nine years. Um, the drinking, I still had drinks, but as far as the drugs, I was clean for nine years. So you were clean for nine years. What triggered your usage after nine years of sobriety? Um, but it was, I was getting to go to therapy um, and I was on medication, doing decently well. And then I stopped all of it cold turkey. And at that time, I, it really uh, affected me doing that. Um, and so that's when I also had an opportunity to relapse and that's how that happened. So just so I'm clear, you were taking prescribed medications. And those, pres those prescribed medications were for what? For the anxiety and the depression. Okay. And then you stopped cold turkey. Yes. And why did you stop cold turkey? Because we, I've known for a long time that she doesn't believe in like mental health issues. You know, it's, it's just not something that she believed in. It's, you know, you're toughen up or you're weak if you're, you know, like that. And so she never liked me on them ever and then the last time when i quit cold turkey you know it started out well you could either have a therapist or you could have you know your mental health medication but we don't need both because the insurance wouldn't cover the therapist and the prescriptions or we didn't have very good insurance so it costed money which you know money's been a stress our entire marriage and so yeah i stopped the therapist and then after a while i just quit that to, to try to better our relationship i, I don't did she ever, did Beth ever ask you to stop taking medications? Yeah, plenty of times. Okay. Uh, what were those conversations like? Um, just like I previously stated, there was a, you can either have your therapist or have the medication, but we need to decide on, you know, can't have both. Uh, before that, it was, um, she's kind of embarrassed that I'm on them. And so that put a strain on our, like uh, love life and stuff like that. So. When you say she's embarrassed taking medication, um, what do you mean by that? Uh, what? You cut out, sorry. When you, sorry, when you said that she was embarrassed that you were taking medications, what do you mean by that? Uh, taking medications for my mental health, embarrassed about me having mental health issues. Was there any point in time that you were taking prescribed medications and you didn't tell her you were taking them? Uh, yes. Did she ever find out about that? Um, yes. And how did she react? She wasn't happy about it, but I didn't tell her because she, you know, doesn't like me taking them in the first place. Okay. Um, yes, I'm going to interrupt. I apologize. Um, so it's, it's noon. Um, at noon, I have a, a all judges meeting that goes to about one thirty, And then at one thirty, um, I volunteered to do the first appearances because I thought it would be at a half day. Um, so I'm going to be doing that for a period of time. And then because I thought it was going to be a half day, I scheduled myself to uh, deliberate for uh, on a trial that I heard on Monday in which I'm delivering a verdict tomorrow. Um, and there's a whole other host of issues I, I was planning on doing. Um, so um, I so I just want to just talk to the parties a little bit about next steps. Um, so um, Mr. Schoenborn, you know, is right in the middle of, of sharing uh, his perspective. Uh, it's important to hear both both perspectives of both mother and father. Um, the number of first appearances, let me just take a look and see how many are on the first appearance. Okay, document. So is we'll probably, I'll probably, probably be done with that fairly quickly, probably two, two o'clock. Uh, so I'm, I'll check with the court clerk to see what her schedule is. If there's uh, availability to go this afternoon, a little bit longer. Okay. She says she's available. So check in with the parties. Uh, if your schedules allow for uh, reconvening, um, at a two. That's fine. Your Honor. I'd like to complete today. Yeah, me too. Ms. Holder. I would, uh, I would as well. My calendar is also free. Okay. Well, let's plan on that. Uh, let's plan on coming back at 2 p.m. and um, we'll we'll convene at that time. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Schornborn, where we left off, we were talking about um, your mental health and the type of treatment and uh, help that you were getting. At the time that you, uh, before the May 3rd, 2020 incident involving domestic violence, what kind of support systems did you have in place? Um, so I started out with no support systems until we had one of our bigger fights. And then after that, I went and got, um, started going to therapy and got back on mental health medication. And do you remember about what year that was? 
um, 2019, early, yeah, late 2019, maybe. It was right, you know, it was coming up to the other fight we had that split. Okay. Uh, what kind of support system did you have at that time? Um, like I said, I got the, uh, the therapist and my doctor. We figured out a medication that worked and I was going uh, once a week um, to see a therapist to talk about some of the issues that were going on. And that, and that stemmed from that fight. And did you go out and seek help voluntarily? Yes. Okay. Um, if Ms. Schornborn had asked you to get help, would you have? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, and after the BV incident in May of 2020, did you get help after that? Yeah. Um, right when the incident happened, uh, Beth texted my parents um, and said that, you know, she wanted me to get help so I could be part of the kids' lives. She gave my mom contact information to Columbia Wellness. And so right when I got out, I signed up for Columbia Wellness for their uh, mental, the mental side and their um, drug uh, program too. So I was in both of their programs and that was just because Beth recommended it. Okay. Um, and when the, um, when the protective order was put in place, the long-term protective order that was done in 2023, um, were you getting any type of support or anything like that at that time? Yeah, I've, uh, so I switched from Columbia Wellness to the uh, Behavioral Health uh, St. John's after a while. Um, and I've been with them ever since. I haven't stopped seeing them. And so, yeah. Prior to the incident in 2020, um, Ms. Shornborn testified that you had very little involvement in the children's lives. Do you agree with that? No, absolutely not. And how do you disagree with it? Uh, I, I agree. I worked a lot, but as far as their extracurricular activities, um, their graduations, their um, school stuff, all of their sporting events, uh, I made a very good amount of those. I, I can only recall a couple instances where I missed a couple of soccer games that were in Vancouver and Portland while I was working. Um, how many games do you think you were able to see? Percentage wise for both of your children. Oh, percentage wise. I mean, Kenna in the nineties, cause she's been doing soccer for so long, all year long. Uh, Gage, I, I can't recall missing any of his games, his practices. Yes. Cause I'd still be at work when they had them, but games wise, I, I can't recall. I missed one. And previously it was mentioned that, um, I believe both of your children played t-ball. Um, what other kind of sports did they play that you know of? Yeah, they both played t-ball. Um, Kenna got into soccer pretty much solely. She played a lot of basketball too. Um, but uh, lately it's just full on soccer. Uh, Gage has done t-ball, basketball, football. Uh, he had one year of wrestling that was just great because I got to go to every one of his practices because they were late enough at night. So I got to kind of, the coach let me help train him one-on-one -on -one every time I was there. Uh, Best cousin, actually, I talked to him and we got him to go too because he was a real good wrestler in high school. And so we got to kind of train Gage one-on-one. -on -one. He moved up real quickly for only, you know, for having that year. Um, yep. And then, you know, he started getting into flag football and then he finally got his pads after the incident. So, Besides going to um, sporting events and extracurricular activities, what other kind of things would you do with the children? I, once I was home, I had anything on the weekends that was that we would go to it'd be as a family um anything from uh easter the last easter we had together we went up to my grandpa or dad's house hit easter eggs did the easter hunt um we went up to his house a consistent amount um every uh october you know we'd go get pumpkins um a lot of the years for Christmas, we'd go with uh, her brother, my brother-in-law, um, and watch him cut down a tree so the kids would get that experience. Um, we never had a live tree in the house. We had a fake one, but still to give the kids that experience, we'd go to that uh, each year. Um, just, now, you, you, mentioned, know, you mentioned your parents. How involved were your parents in the children's lives? They were pretty involved. They, uh, um, My mom, she'd make all the birthdays and... She'd come to the games that she could. She didn't uh, just show up and visit randomly because um, uh, Beth didn't really like my mom as much as my dad. 
Um, my dad, on the other hand, he was more show up randomly on his motorcycle, come in, hang out with the kids and her, even when I'm not there sometimes. Um, you know, and then same with the games. Um, so um, her and my dad were closer. And it's correct that both of your parents were um, supervised. Um, they did supervised visits with you. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. They were both assigned to supervisors and my mom would come up to my dad's house every time Gage was here because it was the only time they were allowed to see their grandkids. And so, yeah, they were both supervisors and they were there every visit. How many visits would you say that was? Um, 30. I don't. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of a blur. It was once a week and then uh, it was once a week plus some of the weekends. And then we got the overnights and then we started getting the unsupervised visits. And so, and even the unsupervised visits, 99% of the time, my parents were there and go into his practices anyways, because that was the only time they got to see him. So. So your parents um, also went to games and sporting events to yes. see the kids? Oh yeah. And how many, and they were, that was pretty frequent? Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever coach the children in anything? Uh, yeah, T-ball. Um, like she said, I wasn't the head coach. Um, I never got a head coach or anything I really wanted to, but with my work schedule, I couldn't do that and, you know, have that obligation and then let the kids down. But I did get to do the assistant coaching um, for T-ball. And I got, you know, the end of the year mug that all the the wives get the coaches for a thank you for coaching and stuff. Um, you know, all the the parties at the end of the year and stuff like that. Yep. Did, and then the wrestling know, and stuff, that was more just a dad butting in, you know, being a dad in sports. I mean, did Beth ever acknowledge your contributions to the the time you spent with the kids for their extracurriculars? Uh, no, I mean, we didn't really discuss it. it was, you know, I'm the dad and she's the mom and we should both be there. I mean, it was, it was kind of expected. I mean, but she never said like, you know, thanks for leaving work and coming to Portland and going back to work or anything like that. No. You, you mentioned that there was uh, like a mug um, and you said that all the soccer moms got you. Do you know where that yeah. mug is now? Um, it's at my mom's house. Yeah. I still got it in my room at my mom's house uh, with some of my other kids stuff. Just to, you know, I got a lot of stuff here at dad's, but when I go over there, I like to have the kids stuff too, to remind me of them. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, we're going to talk about the, the May 3rd incident. Um, and previously, there had been no domestic violence. Um, police had never been called, correct? Oh, that's correct. Okay. Um, so we've heard from Beth. So what, it, what happened that day in your own words? So it, it, I guess it kind of started the night before. Um, it was the weekend, and I wasn't supposed to be working, but I was. Um, I got home. There was some breakdowns at work, so I had to go right back to work again. Gone for a couple more hours. Um, work wasn't going well, a lot of things were down. So I was, I was pretty stressed out with that and getting a lot of calls. Even when I got home, I was having to take calls. Uh, they scheduled one for, I think I had a call in at midnight or 1am. And then I had another one at 6am, uh, just to check in on the continuing progress of what was down at the mill. Um, Do you remember specifically what was down and what the emergency was? Yeah. The came here number two. Um, had a small fire and it burnt up in an electrical junction that controlled basically the whole came here. So our whole pulping system was down, which means we're not making any paper and it's, you know, it's about $3 million a day, 24 hours. So, and you said case. that you had to take some calls. So what did those calls entail? Um, basically it'd be me updating the group on where my guys were with the wiring, um, so I'd have to call my, when I was, wasn't was there, I'd have to call my lead man before the calls, get an update on it. Cause I already spent, you know, 15, 16 hours there and you're not supposed to spend more than that. So I got to have eight hours off. So I get an update and then I call the group with the mill manager and sometimes the owner of the company's on when it's that big of an emergency. Um, and I'd have to update them on the progress and, you know. Okay. So you, you said you had a call around 1 a.m.? Yeah. Yeah. 1231 was the first one because I got home pretty late from the mill. And then that was, I think the first update. Yeah. And then you had a second update. You said around 6 a.m. Yeah. Somewhere around 6 a.m. And then right after that, I finally went to bed for the night or day. You know. And were you prescribed sleep medication at that time? Um, it wasn't sleep medication. I was prescribed uh, Xanax for my panic attacks, but it acts just like sleep medication. So 
with the stress of that night and knowing that I needed to get a little sleep before I went back to that environment, um, I took a Xanax and went to bed. Okay. Um, after you went to bed, after having taken Xanax, what do you remember? I remember waking up at her yelling at me and I, I didn't at the time, I didn't know what it was for, but after seeing some of her declarations throughout the years, I guess it was cause I slept in too long. Um, so it was just kind of an instant fight right off the bat. And I don't usually start yelling right away, but I know I started yelling right away too. And it was, we were fighting like instantly. And I don't know, at the time I didn't know what it was for, but yeah, we were both angry. Okay. Um, and that was the, the incident with the domestic violence. Um, do you remember specifically what you did um, in um, that incident? I, I do remember um, going out into the garage uh, and trying to stop her from leaving when she was super upset because she had the kids in the car and, you know, I'm thinking of that. I do remember in the house, we were really screaming at each other and getting close and I did push her. Um, other than that, uh, after she asked to leave and after I, she, I, oh yeah, I remember her saying, I'm going to call my brother and her brother, we get along great, but he's got a really bad temper. And so I do remember saying something like, you know, you're going to introduce the kids to this kind of show. Like, you know, it would have been me and him fighting. I, I totally believe that if that would have happened. Um, do you remember slamming the door? I, I don't remember slamming the door. Do you remember grabbing her by your arms? I, I, when she was coming through the doorway, um, and I tried to stop her the first time to ask her not to take the children and don't leave. Um, I, yeah, I think I grabbed her arms and she said, let go of me and get out of my way. And I let go and got out of her way. Um, why were you trying to keep her from leaving? Uh, she's made it a point over the years. Yeah. I mean, even the nine years sober, every fight ended with your a piece of shit drug addict. And I'm not going to forgive you for that. And if you ever do it again, you will never see the children. And when that fight happened, it was at the point where like, I could see in her eyes, I was not, or I believed I was never going to see my kids again. Like period. She doesn't, she's never lied. She's very, uh, if she said she's going to do something, she's going to do it. And so that's what was going through my mind was, uh, yeah, I was losing my kids. Um, why did you grab the gun? So I conceal carry all the time and, uh, you know, in hindsight, this wasn't the right time to do it, but when we have big fights, I'm the one that leaves. She stays because she doesn't have anywhere to go, especially with the kids. And so I go to my parents' house. So in my mind, I'm leaving. When I leave, I get my gun, you know, my shoes, clothes, hop in the car and I go. Um, so that's out of instinct, that's what I did. Um, I had basketball shorts on at the time and my holster is in the truck. So that's why I had to walk out of the house and had it in my hands because I didn't have any holster. The only reason I walked out was I turned around and she's already backing out and leaving. And I'm trying to impel her yelling at her that I'm leaving. She doesn't need to. Um, by the time I got down to the end of my truck, she was at, starting to go at the end of the road. And I knew that she wasn't going to come back and let me leave. But. Um, and the pictures that we saw, the the hammer on the gun was uh, was cocked. Is there any reason for that? Yeah, that style of gun, um, it's called a half cock. It's you half cock the gun um, and a safety pin falls in front so you can carry it safely. Um, so the gun wasn't cocked and ready to fire. You would have had to pulled it all the way back. But um, it's actually more unsafe having the hammer sit on the firing pin, not cocked at all when you carry. So that's the that's the safe way to keep that gun at all times. That's why it looks like that. And we also saw some pictures of you um, getting things out of your truck. What were you getting out of your truck? So I was getting um, the gloves that had Suboxone in my truck. I'm getting okay. them out of there. Um, and were you prescribed the Suboxone? No. So if you were not prescribed this box, then why were you using it? Because before that, I 
relapsed after nine years sober and I knew the road that that was going down. And so I was able to get a hold of some Suboxone to get off the opiates I was using. And that's why I was in the middle of taking those. And that's why I had them. Okay. And um, so is it fair to say that you were using the Suboxone to alleviate the symptoms of withdrawal? Absolutely. I, if I was in withdrawal, then I'm not a parent to the children and Beth and I can't go to work. And so, yeah, it's absolutely that. And it's to prevent me from going out and using again. What do your symptoms look like when you withdraw? Um, I get sweaty, um, like clammy. I'll get sick, kind of like flu-like symptoms. Yeah. And how many times have you withdrawn? Um, 10, 12, I, you know, a bunch of times, yeah. Um, are you able to function when you withdraw? Uh, yes. I mean, I'm not like laid up in bed. I, I've never missed work because of drugs or, you know, anything like that. It's just really hard. But yes, I'm still able to fully function. Okay. And you... You pled guilty to the charges of domestic violence for, um, and also um, false imprisonment, correct? Yes. And why did you plead guilty to those charges? Uh, because I was already in uh, the drug treatment program and mental health treatment program. And so if I pled guilty, then I got to go to mental health court. And so instead of dragging the kids and her through a court process, because at the time, like she was calling the kids witnesses and I was thinking if I fight this, the kids are going to have to like take the stand and go through all that with us. And so I picked mental health court because it one supported what I'm already doing. And then two, it didn't put more on them. Okay. And did you graduate from mental health court? Yes. And um, what happened with the charges once you completed mental health court? Uh, all the charges were dropped and the uh, no contact order that was on her and both the children were also dropped. Um, is it fair to say that you agreed to go to mental health court to have those charges dropped? Yes. Okay. And why did you agree to do that? Um, a, a big part was once the charges were dropped, I got the no contact orders, which means I could start going to the games and stuff like that. The other part was I couldn't have anything on my record because getting a job, especially in my profession in management, having something like that on my record would just completely destroy, you know, my reputation of getting a promotions or other jobs. And you were unemployed for a few years. Is that fair to say? Yes. And why were you unemployed? Um, so after the incident, after my relapse, uh, I went back to work way too early. Um, I was in the treatment program, but I still wasn't clean. Um, uh, but my doctor released me cause I wasn't on drugs. I was on the Suboxone. Um, I told work about it. My boss was fine with it. Uh, came back and two days into it, they drug tested me, even though, you know, I was up front and I told them and I was let go. Uh, before that I was on, uh, fam FMLA family leave, you know, just upset and distraught with the divorce. Um, so I took a bunch of time off and I don't think they appreciated that. So when I came back, it was the writing was on the wall. And you've relapsed a few times since the DV incident in 2020, correct? Yes. Do you know how many times you've relapsed? Uh, year four, yeah. Do you, um, what triggers you to relapse? Uh, it usually has to do with the family matters. Um, I mean, one I remember vividly is her second or third declaration um, where she started talking about how I wasn't involved with the kids. And I think she said like a, a has been of a father or it was something saying that, you know, I just was not a good father or husband um, in, in that state and not being able to see my kids and reading that it was, her opinion holds a lot of weight to me. You know, we've been together 20 years. So it was, that was really hard to take. Okay. Um, and in 2023, in January, um, the protective order, there was one that was extended for 15 years. Um, you represented yourself at court. Um, did you agree with that protective order? 
Um, no, I, I tried to fight that protective order because I just got the protective orders dropped because I graduated mental health court. Um, I didn't see why there needed to be another one. Uh, I was pretty confident and that it wasn't going to be extended or approved. And so that's, I represented myself and I was unemployed. So it's, it's, it's tough to get a lawyer. Um, were you okay with the 15 years being in place not to talk to Beth? Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, even before this, when the initial no contact orders got dropped, we went back to court because of um, me going to my bank and discovering that she works there. Um, when I saw her through the drive through window, uh, we had to go back to court for that. And so at the time, the prosecutor wanted to extend the no contact orders. Then he found out what happened, found out that it's been my bank for 20 years, found out that there was no email to my lawyer or any update that she had switched jobs. And so it was basically going to be dropped. Um, my criminal lawyer at the time, Dan, discussed with the prosecuting attorney, what is what do you guys want out of this? And basically she wanted something to say that I wouldn't contact her. And so we agreed on a stip. Um, that said, I won't contact her at all, call her, you know, make eye contact, stuff like that. But we made it so I can still go to the games and there wasn't like a uh, seat restriction or anything like that. And there wasn't anything to do with the kids. So it was strictly just not contacting her. And after that stipulation was put in place, after you agreed to it, um, did you go to any games or anything for the kids? Yeah, I went to every single game that Gage had and he wanted me to, which was everyone. It was okay. real exciting for us because I was only able to hit the games that I was during my approved time before. And so being able to go to those, uh, even if it wasn't my approved time, it was really exciting. Me and my parents went to every single one. And um, were the police ever called on you when you went to those games? Yeah. The uh, second time I went to the Woodland game, after the game, um, I had a birthday party actually at a golf place for one of my buddies. And I got a call from the Woodland police uh, saying that Beth called it because I violated uh, a restraining order. And so I explained the stipulation to him and he had it pulled up on the screen and he, he agreed that it didn't say anything about, you know, I can't be in the same public place. There's no feet restrictions, you know, duh, duh, duh. so he said, I'm going to look into it more. I'll call you back. And he called me back, said, don't worry about it. It's nothing. And that's the last I heard of it. Um, did you ever try to add Beth on social media? I did get a call that on Snapchat, I, I've never had social media before in my life until after the divorce because there was no sense to. I got it now because I figured one day I'd be able to start seeing the kids' pictures and stuff like that. Uh, Snapchat, what I didn't know when I did that is it has an option to take all your contact phone numbers and then just go out and friend request all of your contacts. And so I got a call four or five days later from a sheriff saying, why did you add Beth on Snapchat? And I was really surprised, but that's what that was is it just added everybody. And so she, she gave me a warning. She said, this has happened before. It's not the first time she's dealt with it. And that was the end of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the red canoe bank that Beth works at, did you call them to get bank records? Um, yeah. So we had a joint bank account and then when we split sometime after the split, uh, I went to get groceries and my card was declined. So I went to the bank and I found out that I was pulled off our joint bank account. I didn't even know that was possible, but, um, so yeah, I lost all, all access to all our money. Um, and then later on down the road, uh, Chad wanted to know what date that was that I was pulled Chad off. Being Chad being Chad Zandy. Yeah. My previous lawyer. And so okay. I called the bank and said, Hey, this account, I just need to know the day that I was, taken off of it and, and nothing after that. I just need to know that date. And they're like, Oh, yep. You have that right to that for, you know, that information because it was your account through that time. So I got the date of that and that was the end of it. When I first why got on the phone, have, put me on Why didn't you have, I'm sorry. Why didn't you have Chad or someone from the law office call instead of you? I didn't think there was any reason that I couldn't call about my own bank account. I just, I mean, it was just the question of when, when the bank account got taken from me. So I didn't think anything of it. Did you talk to Beth at the bank? No, absolutely not. Did you ask to talk to her? No. Um, did you, did you know if she was working at the time when you called? 
I don't. So if that was after the incident, then I know she worked there, but I don't know if she was working at the time. No, I, I would have had no information of what her work schedule is. Is um, is there a way that you could have called another branch and gotten that information? Um, maybe. Uh, the way the bank's set up, it's like a 1-800 number or in, just like my fiber is. So when I call it, it just it goes to... I guess the main branch. Um, I don't know if that's set up that way on all banks, but it wasn't like I purposely called the main branch. I just called the number and that that's where it ended up. Right. Um, when you, I'm going to switch gears now. And when you were going to reunification counseling, um, how did you feel like the reunification counseling went? Uh, it was, it was really disappointing. Um, it, it started off, terrible. Um, after she met me, she had to sit down with Beth and the kids that didn't go very well. And Who is then, she? Uh, Beth or, uh, the, um, Patricia, Patricia Anderson, the unification counselor. So after she met with you and the kids, she then met with Beth and the kids, uh, after she met with me singular, then the first, uh, meeting with Kenna, she had Beth with her. Yeah. Right. And what do you know about that visit? Uh, she told me that at the very beginning of it, Beth started, who, who, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, the you? therapist, the reunification yeah. counselor told me that the beginning of it, uh, before she could really get started, Beth started saying about, you know, that he's a drug addict and he tried to murder us and he had a gun and, you know, me and my kids got out of there and the kids saw everything. And uh, it was before she was able to explain to Beth what should be kind of said in front of the children and what shouldn't. Um, so to your knowledge, Beth said in front of Kenna that you tried to murder her yes. and the kids. Yes. Um, and why else do you think that the reunification didn't go well in the beginning? Um, Kenna was just really withdrawn and kind of set in her ways. Uh, what the counselor got out of it and told me was that she's really trying to protect her mom and Gage. And uh, the it ended by her saying that until Beth and best mom uh, start supporting Kenna and seeing me, these aren't going to go anywhere. And so we were kind of at a standstill and that's why they stopped. Um, you filed a motion to hold Beth in contempt for not doing the reunification with Kenna. Why did you do that? Because uh, she was ordered to pick a counselor and get me the counselor's name so I could set up reunification counseling and pay for it. And it went months and months and months with no name, no you know, we asked multiple times. And so we had to actually take her to court and she got put in contempt. And then after that, she got us a name of the person she wanted and we started reunification counseling. Have you seen Kenna since the May 3rd, 2020 incident? Um, only at my son's games that Kenna would go to. Um, no speaking or anything like that, but I, I've seen her from a distance. Yes. Okay. Um, if you were able to go to the children's games, but you knew it made them uncomfortable, would you still go? If the kids did not want me there, I would not go. No. Okay. Um, I want to go back a little bit um, to the, the 2020 incident with the DB. Um, you and Beth uh, admittedly had a rocky relationship. Um, when you would fight, what did those fights look like? Um, I mean, they were often and it, uh, they escalate quickly. And so, you know, there's a lot of yelling and a lot of insults are thrown out and they never resolve. And so when they end and then we have the next fight, that fight comes with the next fight and so on and so on. And um, did you guys ever fight in front of the children? Yes. And how often would you say you did that? more often than we wanted to we we tried not to have the children see that but it would always spill over and the kids would see that fighting a lot and when you say you guys fought and you traded insults um what kind of impact did those insults have on you um like i said earlier uh her her opinion is the only one that matters like i only had one friend uh, <laughs> like my whole time was with her the whole 20 years and so when she says stuff like, you know, you're disgusting or you're 
drug addict, piece of shit, stuff like that. Like it, it holds a lot of weight and it's really hard for me to deal with. Did she say those things in front of the kids? Sometimes. Um, did she know that those words had that kind of impact on you? Um, when we'd try to talk about like the feelings part of the fight, that's when the talking would stop. Um, yeah, it never got past the, the yelling part. Right? So no, I didn't, she didn't want to hear how it made me feel and it was hard to tell her. Okay. Um, when you were able to get um, custody back or visitations back, supervised and unsupervised, you said your parents were doing some of those supervised visits with you. Um, do you know the last time that your children have seen your parents? Um, yeah, it would have been Gage's, uh, well, Gage specifically, it would have been Gage's last visit, um, I think somewhere in January um, was when both the parents and me, you know, his last visit. January of this past year? Uh, yes. Okay. Do you know why they're not in, why your parents are not involved in your children's lives? I, they don't, and I don't, um, like, especially my dad, he was a lot closer with Beth than my mom. And so he's still, he's having a really hard time figuring out why they're getting punished for, you know, her being mad at me. Um, Do you, you know, if they talk to Beth at all? Uh, they used to at the beginning, but any texts or anything like that, uh, th they'd be unanswered now. Right? And you mentioned that Beth had a better relationship with your dad than your mom, correct? Yeah. Um, why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. She, I mean, from the very beginning, uh, she didn't like my mom very well. Um, you know, it wasn't like a hate thing. We, she still went, my mom still came to birthdays and sporting events, but it's not like they go shopping with each other or hang out at the house. Uh, my dad, um, he'd come over, he'd call her sometimes, talk with her instead of me. Um, so they were just on a lot. Yeah. I mean, they were close. Do, e do either of your parents have a history of addiction? Uh, my mom does. Yes. Okay. What addiction is that? Um, she struggled with alcohol while we were younger. And is Beth aware of this addiction? Yeah, Beth knows everything. Did you ever talk with her about it? Um, enough to where Beth knew that that was a thing, yes. Okay. Um, does your mom still have a problem with addiction? No. How do you know that? Um, I lived with her for a while after this breakup, and I, I would have noticed something. Um, so once, once my parents split after we were 18, uh, you know, their moods got a lot better. And I think that had a lot to do with it, I'm guessing, but. Um, so what kind of treatment are you in now? Um, now I, I'm still on my mental health medication. Um, and then I'm going to a drug treatment program, um, where I'm taking methadone and I have one-on-ones with my therapist counselor person. And then I have groups um, every week. Um, and that's what I've been doing for a while now. What, how long is a while now? When do you remember when you started? Three months ago. Yeah. I mean, I never stopped um, the mental health side, but yeah, the uh, right when I lost Gage, I started it. Okay. So you, if I'm not mistaken, you you haven't seen the children since January of 2023. Yes. Or you haven't seen Gage since 2023 when the protective order was put in place. Um, but I believe we, we've we submitted it as evidence that um, his mental health um, through Kelso, um, you started that just before your last trial date was scheduled, correct? Like within a few weeks or a few, a few weeks uh, of that? Yeah, somewhere, somewhere around Is there. there any reason that you started it so close to your original trial date? not a real coincidence. It was just, I know I needed it and I wanted to get back on the right path for my kids. And have you been involved in any other treatment besides the mental health court and beside the one you're currently involved in? Um, well, before mental health court, I was at Columbia Wellness. Um, and then I switched my treatment over to the behavioral health at St. John's. And that was before 
I was sent to mental health court. And are you currently taking any medications besides methadone? Uh, yes, my mental health medication. And what medications are those? Uh, Zoloft and um, Lamotrigine. How do you feel like you're doing with the therapy that you're going to and the medication you're taking? Oh, great. Once once I got on the medication and was seeing the therapist back when like before mental health courts even started and figured out what that depression, anxiety kind of stemmed from and stuff, it I, I got a lot better mentally. I mean, the anxiety, the panic attacks were a lot less. Um, yeah, Do you still I was able to- from panic? Do you still suffer from panic attacks? In real stressful situations, um, like reliving this, I kind of feel like I'm going to have one. Um, when is the most recent time that you've used drugs? Um, maybe two months ago, month and a half, two months ago. I don't recall the date. Um, and how long um, before that time that you, you relapsed, when was the last time you used drugs? Um, probably once in February and once in December, uh, before. And that's when you, and that's when you tested positive in December of 2022? Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you believe led to your relapsing? The, it, it's always something to do with not, the time with the kids, what we thought we'd plan out and like what the GAL had set for us and stuff, like the GAL said that didn't happen. And so every time we'd bring Gage home, he'd be so upset that he'd have to leave, you know, and, you know, he'd be real sad, he'd get out of the car and just seeing that in his face and having to go through that with him and stuff. And it just, you know, I, I'm an addict and I'm weak and that happened. When you said for his visits, he was upset. What do you yeah. mean Gage was upset? Uh, he didn't like how less he was getting to see me. Um, I mean, he loves his mom very much, but he wanted it more like even, you know, so the both of us were happy. Uh, he cares a lot about our feelings and wanting both of us to be happy. And so he really enjoys, like when we finally got the overnight stuff, I mean, we, we wouldn't even go to bed. Like he was so, so happy to get to be there with me for that long a time. And then when we drop him off, he was just always a little sad. How did you feel when he was dropped off after seeing you? Oh, it, it killed me. I felt terrible. Um, and you're aware that Kenna has pretty much no desire to see you. Yes. How do you aware. feel about that? Uh, it, it hurts. Um, she, I, I, she, I thought she was kind of a daddy's girl when I was with her. Like she's got a pretty good temper. And when she got to those real on angry moments i was one of the only ones that could like be calm enough to talk her down you know lay with her and get her to sleep and stuff and so hearing that she was the one that didn't even want to try seeing me i was i was really surprised um yeah that was that was hard to take um and so how would you feel if with the parenting plan that whatever gets put in place how would you feel if you weren't able to see Kenna? I, I mean, the kids come first and I will support her decision 100%. I'm not going to force my way back into her life if she doesn't want me, but uh, I'll never quit missing her. It'll, it's going to be hard forever. I, um, when you did your your visits with Gage, what you said you would stay up all night. What kind of things would you guys do? Uh, during the day, um, we did a lot of Legos. We made a lot of videos. Um, I got them all saved on my phone. He got really into making movies. Um, uh, a lot of the stuff was in the garden. Um, he made me, we do a football game, like a two hand touch football game. Every time he first came over, um, during the nights, we, we catch up on all the Marvel movies. Some of the old ones that he hasn't seen before all the new ones he's seen. So we, would I'd make a air mattress out in the front room and we'd kind of get a camp out in the front room and watch movies all night. And, you know. um, if a parenting plan was put in place that said you couldn't see Gage or Kenna for a year unless you're clean and sober, um, how would you feel about that? It, it'd be devastating. I mean, it's it's been since January already and it's I, it's been hard. 
Um, but if that was put in place, would you abide by it? Absolutely. Um, there are some um, personal property items that we still that are still in dispute. Is there anything that you specifically remember um, that Beth still has in her possession? You heard her testify that someone came by her house with a truck and packed it up and got it to you. Was there anything you didn't get? Uh, yeah, right at the beginning of this, once the second truckload came, I made a list of stuff that was missing, um, gave that to my lawyer. Uh, at first it was, well, well, we'll wait a while because some of the items were weapons. And so it was wait until the mental health court was done and the no contact orders dropped. Uh, we waited once that was done and dropped, then it was, well, you guys waited too long and it's kind of not your stuff. And it's just been the whole three years, it's been hard to get my items and my dad items back to him. Um, do you remember specifically what you're missing or what is yours that is still in best possession? Yeah, it's a pretty long list, but a lot of Milwaukee tools, um, a lot of Husky tool, tool sets, uh, all my um, uh, electrical stuff for work, uh, um, the uh, my golf clubs, uh, paintball gun up in the attic. Uh, I mean, just stuff that, you know, some of it was mine before we were married and, you know, stuff that was just mine. And then a lot of my dad's tools, he'd let us borrow, like, you know, when I put in a fence or put the new floor in the house and then I took time getting them back to him. And so that's some of that stuff's still over there too. Um, with Beth saying that she, um, things were given to you, uh, what did you get back? Did you get back any Anything? I got, I got right. back all my clothes um, and I got back like my work computer and she packed a thing full of like some old pictures that I had before we were married. Um, but yeah, a ton of clothes. And then she did uh, empty out some of the tools that my dad asked for. Those came back. So. Um, during the process of everything that's gone on since May, 2020, um, in your opinion, do you think Beth has been hostile? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Um, did you ever see her even though you didn't speak to her? Um, like during my visitation and the games and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Did anything happen at any of your visitations to what made you believe that she did you ever see her be hostile towards you at any of those events? No, no, no. It was, well, one time uh, kind of spilled over. We went to watch Gage play football and my mom and my sister went and congratulated him after the game. And you could tell that really upset her because she kind of grabbed Gage and took him away. And then when he had his visit the next time, when he got in the car, he started crying. And he told me that on the way home, his mom was really mad that my mom and sister congratulated him because it wasn't during my time and they shouldn't be able to speak to him. And so he thought that like grandma was going to get in trouble or I was going to get in trouble because of that. And so that's how I would find stuff out is what he would tell me. He was upset. Did, have you ever asked him how his mom's doing? No, no. It's, okay. Do you it's ever? Okay. Do you ever ask him how Kenneth, or whenever you were able to talk to him, did you ever ask him how Kenneth was doing? No, no. Sometimes he bring Kenneth up, and I'd let him speak, but no. Like, like I said, that's our time together. Um, back whenever you were doing your um, reunification counseling, um, did the reunification counselor ever talk to you about not using? Gage to get to talk about Ken or talk to Kenna. Yeah, our our very first visit, I got to see both the kids um, when we had the professional supervised counselor there, and then the next visit was when Kenna decided she didn't want to go anymore. And I did slip up when Gage came in, and I didn't see Kenna. I asked him, you know, where's your sister? Because um, I didn't know at the time that she was refusing to go. The counselor grabbed me afterwards after I said that and was like, hey your daughter's not coming. Don't talk to Gage about this, you know? And then I was like, Oh, okay. And that was the end of it. Um, and going back to the personal property, are you asking for any, anything that was marital property that you believe might've been community property that you're missing? Or is it mostly just your, what you believe to be your personal items? Um, what I believe to be my personal items. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't have any more questions at this time. We'll turn the time to Ms. Baldwin. Thank you.
So, Mr. Schoenborn, um, you claim that there was a essentially a nine year period where you didn't use heroin. Is that right? Yes. But during that period of time, you admit that you were still consuming alcohol. Yes. So you weren't really clean off of all substances during that period of time. Never said I was. You admit that you've abused prescription medications previously, like Xanax. I've abused prescription medications like opiates. Have you ever taken more Xanax than was prescribed? Yes. You referenced your current mental health treatment. Did you provide any documents whatsoever to the court regarding your current mental health treatment? Regarding like the treatment I'm in right now? Not substance abuse, mental health treatment that you're in right now. Um, yes, it's the same documents we submitted two, three years ago during my mental health that hasn't changed. So you already have all those. So I'm asking if you submitted anything that shows that you are currently accessing mental health treatment. Is there a document that's current that says that you're accessing mental health treatment that you brought forth today? Uh, I don't recall. Isn't that correct? You haven't seen the children or at least Gage since December when you were positive for using fentanyl? I thought it was the beginning of January, but yes. And after that positive fentanyl test, within a few weeks is when Ms. Schoenborn filed for a domestic violence protection order. Isn't that correct? Yes. Okay. And at that point, based on that test, she believed, and accurately so, that you had used fentanyl. Because of the positive test? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any documentation whatsoever from Patricia Anderson, the counselor? Um, I, I don't recall what my lawyers have. No. Okay. And so you've put a lot of words in Ms. Anderson's mouth today saying she said this and she said that, but you don't have any letters or records that you're relying on for those statements today. Isn't that right? She offered to write a letter to me, but I didn't get it. Your mother has a history of alcoholism. Yep. You admit that you've been diagnosed with a panic disorder. Yes. A mood disorder. Um, all I know I was diagnosed with was depression and anxiety. Okay. Did one of your evaluations indicate a mood disorder as well? I, I don't recall. Okay. You admit you have an opioid use disorder. Yes. And an alcohol use disorder. No. Do you deny that you have an alcohol abuse disorder? I, I don't think alcohol is a problem. No. Okay. I don't drink now. I don't now. Yeah. Okay. Um, you graduated from mental health court in August of 2022. Is that right? Oh, that was a question. Yes. Um, uh, I don't recall the date, but I did graduate from mental health court. That was about a year ago. Is that fair? Yeah. Yes. And by December, you tested positive for fentanyl. Yes. You're asking the court to allow you to continue to consume alcohol. Uh, yes. And you're asking the court that you be allowed to continue to use marijuana, spice, and other things like that. I'm asking the court to put something in there so it doesn't bite me when I'm out on a boat with my friends and somebody sees an alcohol container. You ask, you're asking for no limit there are the only limit is essentially when you're with your children. Isn't that right? Yeah. We put a restriction on it. So I wasn't like drinking in front of the kids or anything. Yeah. Okay. And the Kelso treatment solutions that you provide is a methadone clinic. Is that right? Yes. Okay. You're currently using methadone. Yes. That treatment was not supported by the mental health court when you went through it. Is that correct? I was in a different treatment during the mental health court. Uh, they'd support any regulated treatment like that that I decided to go to. Right. The uh, Kelso Treatment Solutions document that you provide says see attached to drug testing, but you didn't attach anything, did you? Uh, no, I got it right here in front of me, though. Do you know who Kenna plays for in soccer? Um, I do not know her current team. 
I haven't got to go to any of her games. You're currently living with your father? Yes. Okay. And you admit that on the day in question, um, back in May of 2020, you were not suicidal. Oh, the day of the incident? Yes. Um, no. Okay. I don't admit that. All right. Those are my questions, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Shornborn, um, why do you think drinking is not a problem for you? It's just not something I do or I'm interested in. Um, and you mentioned that you don't want to get in trouble if you're out on a boat with your buddies and someone's drinking. Yes. Why is that a fear of yours? Because this last three years, um, any little thing like that that happens, it gets called on or, you know, I'm afraid to go shopping by myself in case I run into her with a no contact order, you know, and that all stems from the bank incident and getting arrested at my kid's basketball game. It was pretty traumatizing going through that. And now it's like, I'm scared going to town. Right? Um, does it feel like asking you or putting those type of restrictions for the alcohol and for the, the marijuana usage, do you feel like it's a punishment? Not a punishment. I just think it's a way to get me in trouble later on to where we're back in the situation where I don't get to see my kids and stuff like that. It's an opportunity to yeah, get me in trouble. I mean, when's, when's the last time you've been drunk? Oh man. Um, right around the incident. In so it's, so it's been over three years. Yeah. Do you, do you ever go out drinking with friends? Um, no. Sometimes I go to the bar with friends, but that's because Rainier, that's all there is at bars, but I, I don't really drink. I have no further questions. Any follow up, Ms. Baldwin? That did not raise anything for me. I'm ready to move to closings. Okay. All right. Mr. Schoenberg, thank you very much. All right. I'll hear from Ms. Baldwin for closing. Thank you, Your Honor. So, uh, we did provide Your Honor with proposed uh, final orders, and we would ask the court um, enter those final orders. Um, I know that Your Honor sometimes likes to think about your decision, um, and that's perfectly fine. Um, if you uh, choose to enter them today, um, you, or if you feel confident about what you're going to do on everything but the parenting plan, you can enter all of it except the parenting plan and just contemplate that. Um, so I just wanted to put that forth. Uh, I know the parties are anxious to have some finality. In this case, the domestic violence cannot be ignored. Um, we have a case where the respondent physically restrained my client, drove her to the ground, uh, caused bruises to her arms and to her knees, and went so far as to remove the ripping off Doc Martin boots, which we can all kind of contemplate what that looks like. That's not easy to do. Pulling those from her feet um, to prevent her from being able to leave a violent situation that was clearly way out of hand. Um, he then, his next step is to go for a gun. My client then is essentially running out of the house, grabbing the kids, and he's going for a gun. And it's a loaded gun, which he never denies. It's loaded. There's a bullet in the chamber. This was a case where we were literally seconds away from somebody dying. I mean, this is as close as I've ever seen a case from, instead of being tried by your honor in this format, being tried by a, a jury of 12. I mean, this is as close as you can get. And he really doesn't face that whatsoever. He glosses it over and really victim, victim blames. It's, well, I was triggered. It was really her fault for yelling at me. She started it. You know, it's surprising that with the amount of sort of work that's been put into Mr. Schoenborn, both by the court and various treatments, there's zero insight into how that impacted the kids or how that impacted my client. And that's really clear, really clear here. These are children who were in the middle of that incident. They witnessed it. They saw it. They were part of it. Uh, my client talks about a kid crying um, as they're witnessing what's happening. And one of the kids saying essentially, mommy, go faster. Get us out of here as he's running down the driveway, gun pulled. It's astounding to me that he claims, oh, I was just going to my car. The video, the video is the proof. You see the car backing out and him running after it, gun pulled, gun in hand, bullet in the chamber. That's how close this came. That's what those children of this case saw. And he never takes accountability. Across the board, Mr. Schoenborn doesn't take accountability for his actions. The May incident, he doesn't take accountability for, but he doesn't take accountability for his own sobriety. It's always, it's, it's some triggers fault. It's Ms. Schoenborn's fault. It's the court's fault. It's the children's emotions that caused it. Never once does he say, you know, I made that choice and that's on me and I have to own it. 
he really never does. Um, now, interestingly, Mr. Schoenborn admits that my client is a truth teller. He says, yeah, she doesn't lie. Like what she says is what happened. And he doesn't even say he can't remember what happened. I don't really buy that. I think he does remember. He doesn't want to face it because to face it requires accountability. In looking through the parenting plan, I'm going to talk specifically about the parenting plan pieces um, that uh, we've talked about and where we are disagreed. So we're agreed to my plan as you go through. Um, we're agreed to the findings at 3A as far as domestic violence and as far as uh, assault. What we don't agree on is child abuse at 3A. Again, we have a domestic violence involving the children, involving a gun, um, the child getting hit with the shoe. My client says he looked up, he saw her, he threw it at her. Um, that is child abuse. Looking at 3B, again, we have several agreed findings and agreed finding of neglect. Mr. Schoenborn really is not involved at this point and hasn't been involved for an extended period of time with the children. Agreed findings of substance abuse. What's disputed by Mr. Schoenborn is that he has an emotional problem. But again, the evidence here is very clear. We have professional and repeated diagnoses of anxiety, of depression, of mood disorder, and of panic disorder, and that these all significantly impact him. They impact his ability to parent and arguably his ability to just live generally. So there's uh, a lot of evidence um, within the file, and there's a lot of evidence that Mr. Schoenborn admits to you in his own testimony um, that he has these disorders and that they impact him significantly. When we look at the limits, um, again, when we're going through the parenting plan, the limits are all agreed except essentially the 100% prohibition on alcohol and other mind-altering um, uh, mind substances. Mr. Schoenborn says, hey, it's not a problem for me. I just want an eight-hour limit. But again, this doesn't make sense in the face of the evidence. We have somebody with a formal SUD evaluation where a formal finding of severe opioid use, but also moderate alcohol abuse. And my client says, look, it was just always a trade. He'd stop, uh, stop taking illegal drugs, he'd start drinking. He'd stop drinking, he'd start taking illegal drugs. And you kind of hear that in his own testimony as well. And here it's just like, oh, it's not really a problem for me. Oh, well, by the way, I go to the bars. Oh, by the way, I drink with my buddies. So he really has zero clean time. He says, well, I'm clean. No, he's not. He's has zero clean time ever. He continues to drink alcohol. He continues to not be clean. He's not even contemplative of the fact that this is a problem. And he has a family history of alcoholism. A lot of red flags here. Um, so again, the prohibitions against no drinking, period, no, uh, uh, no mind altering substances, period. That's a no brainer. Um, it's just very straightforward that this is somebody who struggles with addiction it can't be, I can get loaded all weekend and I'll see a Tuesday kid. That doesn't work. It doesn't work for addiction and it doesn't work for the children of this action. When we look at evaluations, again, um, through the parenting plan, we're agreed uh, that Mr. Schoenborn needs to submit to a domestic violence evaluation. We're agreed that he needs to submit to a substance use evaluation and the guardian ad litem confirms that. We need to sort of know where he is at this point. Um, the only dispute is a psychological evaluation. My client wants Mr. Schoenborn to provide a psychological evaluation as indicated. Um, Mr. says, gee, I want it to be mutual. There's no, no basis for it to be mutual. Again, Mr. Schoenborn has anxiety, depression, mood disorder, panic disorder. He has a lot of psychological issues that there's no real indication he's got to the bottom of. There's no indication he's treating it currently other than with other drugs, but that he hasn't actually gotten to the base of why he has these problems. And until he can treat or understand sort of the, uh, the underlying causes, he's never likely to be able to successfully remain sober. So that's why my client wants him to get that evaluation and the treatment associated with it. There's nothing that supports the same for my client. Um, the, uh, he never provides any testimony that indicates any psychological problem whatsoever. My client says, hey, you know, after this incident, this was a big deal. I got some personal counseling, um, went back to a normal, healthy life, was discharged. No one disputes that. There's just nothing that disputes that whatsoever. So again, in this case, uh, Mr. Schoenborn should be required to do the evaluation and any treatment that is recommended as a result of that. Um, I think it's interesting when you look at Mr. Schoenborn and a lot of his arguments about mental health, it's very much blame the victim. Um, blame is Schoenborn. It's her fault they have these issues. It's her fault they didn't address these issues. But it doesn't bear out um, when you look at the actual evidence. He wants to blame her. But when you actually look at what happened, it doesn't fit with his sort of uh, findings of the facts. Um, First of all, after the May incident, my client immediately engaged herself and the two children in mental health. That's not somebody who doesn't believe in mental health. Um, she was the one, per him, who provided him with Columbia Wellness's information and said, you should, he needs to contact these people and get some help. So again, that doesn't match with she, she stigmatized it. She's the one that's getting herself, her kids, encouraging him to all get treatment. Where he says that they really agree, sort of the proof is in the, the, uh, this piece right here. There was a part in his testimony where he's talking about how, hey, at one point, you could choose to use Xanax and the medication, or you could choose to go to therapy, but you couldn't choose both. 
And my client, having seen somebody struggle with substance abuse, abused those same medications, abused Xanax, said, you shouldn't do this. This is a bad idea. This is going to get you into trouble because you abuse these medications. You should do therapy. And he didn't want to. That was the dispute. She didn't stigmatize using those medications. She wanted him to address the underlying issues. So again, this idea that it's sort of my client's fault, completely the opposite. She was looking after his sobriety and his mental health instead of just choosing one or the other. So again, he should be required to do the evaluations um, and uh, the treatment that's required. And looking at section eight, which is the phased in schedule and sort of how that phased in schedule is going to work. Um, I'd ask that the court adopt my phase in um, program. Phases one and two can run together. That's essentially the evaluations and treatment and also remaining sober. So those can run um, concurrently. Um, they're not designed to run consecutively. But where we are is Mr. Still isn't clean now. He wouldn't have a clean hair follicle test now. Um, a, he's using methadone and arguably he used methadone and then also used other substances in addition to methadone. So he said, hey, my last use was two months ago. So even as we stand now, he's not clean. And there are real concerns about his commitment to sobriety. Um, he started treatment essentially the month before our last trial date. Uh, we were continued out to this date um, due to his request for continuance. So again, um, a lot of questions there as to sort of his integrity um, going forward there. My client wants him to be clean, would love for him to re-engage, but if the children are ready, if he is ready and he is healthy and he is sober, and those are reasonable things and benchmarks to require. Um, again, my client has supported reunification, and that's shown by the fact that Gage reunified. If my client was sabotaging reunification, Gage wouldn't have, but my client supported that child. She's supporting two children who were two very different humans, um, and that's normal. Um, so again, this idea that my client is sort of sabotaging things, no. It's important to look at, at Kenna. She's her own person. She was older um, when this domestic violence incident happened. Kenna's mental health records indicate that sort of forcing her is not going to work. It's not going to be successful. In fact, the recommendation that we provide um, uh, within the treatment records is Kenna thrives in a safe and nurturing environment with consistent and predictable caregivers. Children who've witnessed domestic violence need the ability to vocalize their needs, have a sense of control over their life, and be surrounded by safe adults. Kenna appears to function uh, better with structure and uh, when structure and routine are maintained. So again, um, Kenna's a different person. She has different needs. Um, if you look at Mr.'s plan, it doesn't even really make sense. Um, from the best of my ability, they essentially took my proposed plan and then chopped it several times, but some of it is just internally inconsistent um, and doesn't make any sense. Um, when you look at um, the phone calls that are supposed to occur, the phone calls would force Kenna with zero counseling on board to just cold call um, Mr. Schoenborn. That's not going to work. Um, that's damaging. I mean, it, it's illogical in this sense. The uh, Gage has gone about a year without seeing his dad and Kenna's gone about three years. Well, we're approaching three and a half years without seeing her dad. These children, it, this is not a quick reunification. And that's especially true for Gage where Gage is reunified once and kind of been burned by that situation. That young man is understandably weird. Um, this idea it's all sunshine and roses doesn't really fit. Um, so we are asking uh, the courts to think about that and um, think about that these are children with their own feelings, experiences, and thoughts. And unfortunately, they experience something extremely traumatic. So we're asking the court to adopt my client's plan. It's reasonable. It's in the children's best interest. It allows for a path back. As far as personal property, um, that is something that that ship sailed years ago. Uh, my client says, I returned truckloads to him, made every effort to get things back to him. Um, Mr. Even says, yeah, a bunch of stuff did come back. I'm asking the court not make any additional transfers. That's not reasonable. Um, Mr. Originally had made some claims regarding firearms. He does not appear to support those now. Um, there should not be any transfer of any firearms. They should be all awarded to my client. Um, she doesn't have any desire to uh, sell them off, but at the same time, um, does not want them transferred to somebody who is currently, uh, currently an addict, I would argue still uncontrolled, um, who has a domestic violence protection order and arguably cannot, uh, cannot uh, own or possess firearms at this time. As far as attorney fees, this case has been extremely expensive. This has been a more than three year process. Um, that's been largely due to uh, Mr. Schoenborn um, not being clean, um, his criminal actions, there's been contempts, there's been hearings. Um, we This is our third trial set. Um, Mr. Schoenborn came to the first trial set and asked for continuance. The second trial set at trial um, asked for a continuance. So those things just realistically add significant cost. When you prepare for trial three times, it's not a, it's not a flat rate. Um, my client spent a significant amount. Um, there's also a high disparity in income. Mr. is working. Um, he makes about $9,100 uh, per month gross. My client makes about 41, so less than half of that gross. That's a significant disparity. 
my client in this case is asking for fees of $30,000. Those would be um, taken from the West Rock 401k. So we have agreed where they'll come from if the court awards them. So it's not coming out of his pocket. It's coming from the 401k that allows for assurance it gets paid. So we're not sort of entering a judgment and having it just be a paper judgment. Um, but in this case, it is very reasonable to have a significant award of fees after sort of three years um, of this case being in process and multiple trial sets um, that Mr. Schoenborn was not prepared for until this third one. So with that, we are asking um, for the for that relief. Um, we appreciate your honor listening to everyone today. Um, the documents um, are provided for you as well, so that you can also review those. Thank you, Ms. Walton. All right, Ms. Holder. Okay, thank you. Um, to say that Mr. Schornborn is not remorseful or has accountability or lacks accountability for his actions for the domestic violence, that is untrue. Um, there is no history of domestic violence. That was one incident. There was the police have never been called before then. Police have not been called since then. It's true what Ms. Baldwin says about the children witnessing a traumatic event. It's absolutely true. Um, the children should still be engaged in counseling, as should my client. And um, I hope that Ms. Schornborn is also still um, seeking treatment and/or therapy if she needs it, because uh, that is agreed. It is a very traumatic event. What happened? Um, but nothing like that has happened again. Um, they're trying to paint Mr. Schornborn as a violent person who cannot be trusted around his own children. Um, and that is why his domestic violence protective order should be kept in place as they don't trust him around his children, even though when he was going through reunification counseling and while he was going through supervised visit, there was no any indication that he ever physically harmed his children. The event that happened on um, May 3rd with the domestic violence and the shoe hitting Kenna, um, that was an accident. Mr. Schornborn didn't see her around the corner. He didn't mean to hit his daughter. Um, again, no significant history of domestic violence. This was one event. Mr. Schornborn is remorseful. Um, to say that he is not taking accountability, the assessment that was done back in 2020 was within a few weeks of his, um, his being arrested. That was three years ago. In those three years, he has taken accountability. He is a recovering addict. That is a fact. Um, he has been in and out of treatment, in and out of therapy, taken medications, taken too much medication. He does not deny that fact. Um, but as per his testimony, he's not a raging alcoholic. He says he hasn't even been drunk since 2020. To suggest that he is going to have an all-night bender and then see his children is just inaccurate. There is no ind any indication that that has ever happened. Um, he is just weary that if he's around someone who's using alcohol, that somehow there might be a picture taken and it can be alleged that he's drinking. There's a beer can next to him. He should automatically lose custody, resort back to phase one. Um, it almost feels like a trap at that point. And that is what Mr. Schornborn's reservation is for. Um, as far as the parenting plan that we have suggested, Ms. Baldwin is correct. It was a, a bit of a copy and paste job of what she suggested because she did suggest a lot of good things that are completely reasonable considering the circumstances. Um, as far as the reasonability of the time requirements that Mr. Shornborn demonstrate that he is clean and sober, it has already been three years since the DV incident. It has been since January since he's seen his his son. He, in his testimony, said that he understands if Kenna doesn't want to reunify. It would hurt him, but he understands it. He doesn't want to force his kids to do anything that they don't want to do. Um, you heard him say that if they didn't want him to be at his games, he wouldn't want to go because he wouldn't want to upset them. This parenting plan should be about the best interest of the children, not punishing Mr. Shornborn for being an addict. As far as victim blaming, this isn't blaming, it is explaining. When addicts and people with mental health issues have issues, there are things that trigger them. That is true. There are things that make their condition better. There are things that make them worse. It is worth understanding what those things are to put things into context. Mr. Shornborn is not saying that it is completely Ms. Shornborn's fault that the domestic violence event happened. He put things into context to show I was asleep. I took sleep medication. It was completely normal in their relationship to be yelling in front of the children and to be fighting in front of the children and to be trading insults. That in itself is a form of child abuse that Ms. Shornborn also engaged in. But we're not bringing that fact to say that she should be punished or that she should be limited. It is to put in context of he was under stress. That stress caused him to lash out on top of the fact that he is an addict. Um, and to say that he's not taking responsibility and accountability, he did. He pled guilty to that, understanding that he was going to go to mental health court. He was going to have those charges dismissed, because not because he was avoiding 
responsibility or accountability because he very well could have taken it to court. He could have been charged um, and had a jury of 12 look at this case, but he didn't. He wanted to work towards what was best for his children. And that wasn't repeating what happened and re-traumatizing them. That was to admit, you know what, I screwed up. Let's move forward. Um, he has relapsed. He was honest with the court. He um, has admitted that he is two months sober now. It is an admittedly hard thing for an addict and a recovering addict when they don't have a support system to stay clean. So not giving a, an excuse or blaming anyone for his own addiction, but to put into context, he had a really hard time when he didn't feel supported in his relationship, in his marriage. Now that he is on his own, he is seeking treatment and it's still rough. There are good days, there are bad days, but he is trying. And for a parenting plan and for a final settlement to come through as being punitive um, instead of going toward the best interest of the children um, is just wrong. And Mr. Shornborn wants to have a good relationship with the children. He wants them to go into counseling. He wants to be in counseling. He wants to take it slowly. We're not asking that he immediately be able to see them. Um, and he, we would agree that they do need the reunification counseling before he contacts them. And it is completely up to the children and should be child led. We agree with that. But reasonable efforts should be made to encourage the children. That is one thing in Ms. Schornborn's testimony that came forward is it doesn't sound like she was very encouraging in the, the fact that she just drove the kids to to the reunification counseling and said, well, I drove you here. That's me supporting you. Do what you want to do. Um, we would admit that the opportunity to reunify with Kenna, that that ship has sailed. And you heard it from Mr. Schornborn that he wants to be involved in her life and it would hurt him, but he's completely understanding of where he's at. Um, and through Mrs. Schornborn's testimony, you heard that throughout the course of their relationship, um, they really didn't talk about things. They didn't talk about mental health. They didn't communicate. There was a breakdown of communication that clearly has been an issue with the parties. And again, not to blame anybody, but to explain the context of why it was so difficult and why he relapsed a lot. Um, and he has relapsed twice since um, the order was put in place, um, sorry, in December of 2022. And, and recently, it's, it's not easy, but he is trying. Um, Miss Baldwin has said in the past that you can't be a parent and use drugs at the same time. We would agree. That's one of the reasons that we have suggested and we have put in front of the court a, a more strict version. And Mr. Schornborn is, and agrees with that. And, you know, I asked him, how would you feel if you didn't get to see your children for a full year? He said, you know, that I wouldn't like that. But I, I understand. Um, and he understands because he is taking accountability for the fact of what happened and how traumatic this was for the children and how it's still traumatic to them. Um, so we would ask that the court, if it does not adopt our parenting plan, that it would seriously consider um, what the GAL said in this case. Um, it, it, I would fully expect the court to come somewhere down in the middle and not to just go by one or the other, but to take serious consideration what is in the best interest for the children. Um, as far as the attorney's fees, as a part of our uh, settlement, Mr. Schornborn has already paid about $4,500 in, in attorney's fees. I don't disagree that this case has gone on for quite a while. Part of the reason it went on was not was due to Mr. Um, Schornborn's addiction and his recovery, but also was because he was unemployed and couldn't afford a lawyer. And he went back and forth with being able to afford an attorney. Um, and that was the reason that he canceled the last trial. It was he didn't have an attorney and he felt that he got burned when he went to court for the 15 year protection order. And because he wasn't represented, he didn't want to go to a trial unrepresented. Um, so, yes, he did delay and he did pay a penalty for that. And he part of that judgment is coming out and is being paid out of the West Rock account. Um, I would understand that the court think it. Um, it necessary for him to pay some of the attorney's fees as uh, Ms. Schornborn has accumulated quite a bit. But I think to ask for the entire amount is a little much as she also dragged some of the the, um, the case out by failing to work for reunification, not scheduling reunification counseling and having to go in for contempt. So not that um, she is completely responsible, but she does share some of the responsibility for the case taking as long as it did. Um, regarding the personal property, um, it's been three years. I wouldn't argue the ship has sailed for getting his personal possessions back. It sounds to me from his testimony that there are still some rather important and expensive tools and um, he does use them and he could use them for his job. So he would like to have some of those things back. Um, and um, I think that is everything, Your Honor. And forgive me if I'm missing anything, but we would just ask that the court, if it does not choose to adopt our parenting plan, that it takes seriously um, a and an al amalgamation between the two in best interest of the parties and the best interest of the children. All right. Thank you, Ms. Holter. All right. Um, I'd like uh, like 30 minutes and then we'll reconvene in 30 minutes and I'll give you my decision. Very good. Okay. Thank you.